Everyone knows about the Galaxy family, the iPhone, and the Surface. But do you know what a Gotenna is? What about amps? And how much do you really know about Amazon's Fire Phone? We'll see, and we'll see good on episode 105 of the Pocket Now Weekly, the once-a-week podcast where we discuss news and opinion from the world of smartphones, tablets, wearables, and other gadgets you wished existed when you were a kid. From a cozy sound booth in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm your host, Michael Fisher. Joining me on the podcasting platform today is a righteous team indeed. From a cathode ray tube somewhere in New Jersey, my New York City traveling companion, chief news slinger Stephen Schenk. Hello again. What it is, Michael. What it is indeed, jive turkey. From a basement somewhere below North Carolina soil, the man whose buttons I like to pressy, senior editor Taylor Martin. Hey, man. What's up? And I'm actually above soil. You can see it outside. Yeah, I know. You ruined everything. I wrote the script before you showed up. And from the faraway land of where the hell have you been, joining us again for the first time in a long time, the Android guy himself, Joe Levi. Welcome back, man. Hey, thanks. With pings that are terrible and internet, that is spotty. But if I tried to cancel, I'd have a SoundCloud to share with Comcast. I was just oh. gonna say, I was like, "Wow, we're gonna wait. We're gonna wait four it's seconds for that response." <laughs> well, uh, you know, Joe, let's let's just muddle through the best we can. Joe Levi, the man. I, I have to say, um, it is really, really exciting to have you back on the show for a variety of reasons. We'll go into in a second, but as as well informed as you are about the internet, and as 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 many legions of information, many volumes of knowledge you have above me with regard to this stuff. You have one of the worst internet connections for video conferencing I've ever seen in my life. Ever. Uh, you you should see my rig right now. I, I have a power line drug halfway across the room. I've got an Ethernet cable <laughs> suspended three feet above the ground going directly into the router. It's amazing. It's King awesome. cans. The speeds are great. The latencies are... There, well, you know, that you, you don't get something for nothing, as, uh, as someone once said. Um, I, I want to make a point... Possible. I want to make a point before Taylor says that, uh, because everyone needs to know something. Uh, our friends over at Swappa.com are the sponsors of the Pocket Now Weekly. Swappa, if you don't know, it's a marketplace to buy and sell gently used phones, tablets, and watches. Just a few weeks ago, Swappa launched a new feature called the Boneyard, which lets you buy and sell accessories and phones in need of repair and other mobile items that aren't eligible for sale on the main site where only gently used devices are allowed. So check out swappa.com slash boneyard, which is a cool name, by the way, to see the selection of low-cost accessories and very affordable devices that might just need a small repair. And thanks to Swappa that, for sponsoring That's really it. cool. Good stuff. Isn't it? Yeah, it's sweet, right? Joe hasn't been on since we've, since we've had Swappa as a sponsor. Yeah, and they're getting their name out there. I noticed that um, the Oppo XDA DevCon sponsorship, Swappa's doing that as well. I did not know that. Yeah. Thank you All for the heads up. Uh, we have some announcements to get through, folks. I'm going to go ahead and sign the invisible chime on that, and there it went. Bing bong. Uh, we have uh, we have we have a couple things to get through here. Most notably, the fact that Stephen and I have just returned from a trip to New York City. Wasn't that fun, Stephen? E apple, windy, the windy apple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a good time. <laughs> Absolutely, the, the the jewel of the Mississippi. I think they call mm. it. And uh, we did have a ball. AT&T graciously hosted us for an evening where uh, we got to see a lot of unreleased stuff. And as I said in uh, my written piece on this, it chiefly reminded me of how busy a review season it's been and also how sort of lucky we've been to get everything because everything AT&T had on display we had already reviewed, which was really nice. Well, you reviewed it. I had a chance to see a lot of this stuff for the first time, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, it was so cool because like Stephen comes in you guys and and you know we kind of catch up in person for a second it was my first time meeting Stephen in person so that was really exciting and then we go into the device room and I'm kind of like yeah we've kind of we've we've reviewed all this stuff let me take you over here and Stephen's like oh is that is that the like is that the one I made I'm like yeah dude that's old I don't even care about that <laughs> I'm like, not to me I reviewed that back when like I was wearing a a big a parka to survive the elements. Like, how have you not seen this yet? No, but it was great. So so Steve, I was able to see the whole device array through Stephen's like sort of you know fresh eyes, and that was a nice fun experiment in perspective. But of course, the big star of the evening was the Amazon Fire Phone, which we both got to take a close look at, and uh, that was really That's interesting. Something. Yeah, was Stephen, what were your? I uh, beg your pardon. Was it a maze balls? That's always was, my question. It is your question, always. I should anticipate it from here on out. Uh, 
You know, there were elements of it that were really impressive. Uh, and the presentation was, was not <laughs> necessary. Good, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, off. it's a really difficult story to, 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 to effectively sell because no matter what good things I think about it, it's all kind of superseded by the fact that it's they've got this weird exclusivity arrangement with AT&T. They're charging uh, flagship prices for it, and it's not really a flagship Android phone. Um, but, but but all that said, I think it's come together exactly as Amazon intended it to, even if it's not how we would have thought that a company should be launching a phone, and you know, all the pieces seem to fit. It has this... The uh, the perspective shifting is is kind of pervasive throughout the UI. It's it works. I mean, it doesn't seem like just a one note thing. It really feels like a phone that they spent a lot of time thinking out. So it might have more of a chance we're giving it credit for, assuming that these weird launch things don't turn off so people actually that the, thinking that, they will. That's my principal beef. Actually, is that Stephen? Yeah. I agree with you. There's some there's some really cool stuff in the device, and we'll talk about the dynamic perspective uh, in particular. But I I don't think any of these are going to get um I don't think I don't think any people are going to get a chance to see any of this because it's going to be immediately priced out of their consideration uh, once people realize it's not a real Android phone and that it doesn't have the Play Store, you know, uh, that that the UI kind of looks like this rehashed HTC Sense from 2010. You know, it's like... <laughs> yeah, you were well, not too happy about that. No, I sure wasn't. But I, I will tell you, though, a dynamic perspective is not just another, like, warmed-over attempt at a crappy 3D panel. It is amazing. Joe, I made this joke in the write-up, and you're the only one on the air who'd get it. I wanted to call it the Iconian phone because, you know, it looked like you could hold an interdimensional portal in your hand, and it looked like like a... A, a, a zero dimension plane into which you looked to see other worlds. <laughs> and it's so smart too, you know. I mean, it knows when you're looking at it. If you pass your phone to someone else, it intelligently moves to analyze their face and then you know do the thing. If someone's looking at your phone over your shoulder, it doesn't get confused. It knows which one of you to pay attention to with its four front-facing cameras that you should always be aware are there. <laughs> that's just weird. And now all of our iris scans are registered in Amazon's database, so that's good too. Naturally. So yeah, we're already ahead of the game when we start uh, <laughs> cataloging our, our faces and our eyeballs more thoroughly. But I, for one, welcome our new robotic overlords. Indeed, yes. Well, I, uh, And that wasn't it. I mean, you know, they demoed Firefly as well, so um, I was a little I'm disappointed. Sorry, season 2 of Firefly? What? I know, I kept thinking that the whole time. Like, yeah, you get a free copy of the entire season one of Firefly when you buy the Fire Phone. Now, uh, they threw down a box of, like, what were they, Stephen? What was the candy they were using with the yellow box? Oh, I didn't see the candy. They put a bunch of Xbox games out when I looked at it. All right, they had candy out when I went to go see it. And, you know, they tossed the box down on the, on the desktop and fired up Firefly. And it is cool. You, you see the phone start to, like, recognize the object on the desk and all these little glowing sprites kind of gather around whatever it's looking at and then you know Holy eat it up unnecessary i can but it. still it looks really neat yeah yeah no it does look really neat and and it and it functions effectively now steven you talked to them a little bit uh, about bringing firefly to other platforms because that is the question a lot of people are asking can we just would amazon just port this to an iphone or to an android device so that we can have this experience without having to buy an overpriced Fire Phone, but right. you got uh, some mixed news on that? Yeah, I mean, from an outsider, this sounds like the sensible thing to do, because we look at the, the Fire Phone as a, a conduit for Amazon to sell all of its many products it offers, and Firefly, you know, that's direct tie into that. It takes things in the real world and shows you how to order them online. So you'd think that it would make sense for them to make this software as widely available as possible. And the thing is, they sort of already do. Uh, Amazon told me that the, the image recognition stuff, a lot of that's already baked into the Amazon app. And sure enough, I checked, and yeah, it does this. It'll, it even has the same little fly-around uh, Firefly visual effects there. Oh, really? But, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't but, know that. Uh, it's not the complete experience, um, and it wasn't clear exactly what's missing. I think maybe like the audio recognition might not be part of what's in the app now, because right now it has a very like um, sound hound type thing where it'll pick up on songs. It, it's really cool. It should like write in the song where it is. Um, so part of it's there. Um, but for the full experience, you're going to have to tune into or have to pick up a full-on Fire Phone. So you, know, yeah. you got to have some way to convince people to buy them, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> uh, if you uh, if you have the Amazon app on iOS, this is what yeah. it does. It, you can scan a barcode and take pictures of things. And Yeah, the barcode, I knew it did, but the... Act 
straight up just visual product recognition. I you know, wasn't aware that was available, but sure enough. If you it's hit the pretty board, wild it's stuff. called Flow, and there's the visual. You can't really see it because the polarization. Yeah, it's all sorts of lovely colors. <laughs> oh, and speaking of polarization, actually, that was one of the things. So oh, I talked yeah. to him for about 10 minutes, and I loved it. This is my, one of my least, uh, one of the most under-celebrated uh, aspects of the Fire Phone is that they, they did put a lot of thought into little small things like the polarization of the display. It's, it's circularly polarized. So this thing that happens to me in the summertime when I'm wearing sunglasses outside... And it's the strangest thing. If, you, if you've ever seen it, you're taking your phone, you look at it vertically, you're like, okay, cool. And then you go to take a picture of something. Where would my phone go? Yeah, you rotate it to landscape, and it's like your screen turns off because of the, the polarization direction of the, of the screen. So they thought about this when they were building the Fire Phone, and they, they implemented a polarization scheme that allows you to use it in all orientations with, uh, with sunglasses. Yeah, Unless you have again, circularly polarized sunglasses for some bizarre reason. Right, in which case, <laughs> yeah, in which case, uh, you know, you're probably yeah, working problems. for a government agency that, yeah, that has different priorities. But, um, you know, little details like that, and, and, and the simple fact that, um, you know, the uh, dynamic... What is it called again? Dynamic perspective. perspective. Yeah, yeah, just just works so flawlessly, and 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 really was impressive. Um, and there was there was one other. Oh, they didn't demo it, but the uh, the the Mayday stuff is going to be pretty compelling yeah. to some people. So, um, Mayday's been like, around for a while. Right, yeah, right, but it's never not in a smartphone though. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> did you find that that dynamic dynamic perspective was actually helpful in any way? Or was no. it just kind of gimmicky? No, I mean, it's not, not, a, not a single increased, like, use. The, like, the, no, they actually... It's more natural when you're doing stuff. Like in the, uh, the Maps app they have, which was, I think it's a custom map thing powered by the here data. But, like, you can kind of peek around buildings. So when you have the 3D view, it works really well. It doesn't necessarily make it easier to get around, but it's, it, it works in naturally. It's not mm -hmm. like a, they're just showing off for the sake of showing off. You right, but I think most of... most of it though is that like it is just showing off for this. It's like just doing this so, because <laughs> they can. lie, yeah. And, and when you can do something this well, I think there's something to be said for that. There's, I don't mind showing off if you can back it up. If you, if you, it's like, hey, watch what I can do. I'm like, all right, show me what you got. And then it's like, oh no, that is really impressive. I don't even really care that it's not useful. That's cool. Dynamic perspective is really cool. And then there's little sub levels of that feature set which are not part of the 3D effect, but it's part of the motion suite. So. Uh, if oh, you know, yeah, like the it, tilt scrolling and all that. Yeah, like, you know how if you're in an app uh, like like the Facebook app where you can tap in the upper left corner to reveal you know a sliding pane with the options, the you know, list of options. On the Fire Phone, you can just flick it in your hand uh, to the right a little bit and just go pink, and it'll open up that that sliding list, and you can go the other direction for the other side. And yeah, and it would differentiate between the left right tilts, and there was even a rotation motion you could use to pull up different menus. Yeah. Did it not like? If you slowly do it, does it not like rotate the screen or something? Because that, that's no, the big concern is that it's accidentally taking you know a gesture like that and rotating the screen, or vice versa. When you want to rotate the screen, it's just doing the gesture because you've got these similar kind of motions that you're going to be doing with the phone. Right, that's overlap. true. From what I saw, for, you know, and, and it wasn't just them holding the thing. You know, we got to go real hands-on with it and just kind of use it. And no, it it was pretty reliable and pretty fluid and I had no like false there was never a time when I tried to trigger an action that it didn't work and there was never a time that an action was triggered that I didn't ask for so it's it seems pretty solid which is good because the thing is launching in like four days so it should be <laughs> okay this firefly thing on the uh, Amazon app is really kinda cool and it only works about one out of every five times. Oh, when it does. For the last, for the last I know, I've been, I've been playing been, like, shopping. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, did you Firefly Firefly? Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what Dynamic Perspective has always reminded me of. And for those of you who don't know what this is, this is the Spotlight app on, on the oh, Moto Auto Max. Max. Yeah, and that, it, that's... I feel like most of it's actual real-world use cases is probably some sort of gimmick. And that, that's, I don't know, I just feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like not every... not a selling point for a phone. No, it's not. And every um, every bit of augmented reality, I think, up to this point, has, has sort of followed that track where it's like, it's announced and people are like, wow, I can hold up my phone like a, like a tricorder or whatever and it'll magically overlay things in the background that I can walk toward. Like, that seems really amazing. And then it launches and either the implementation is buggy or the perfect implementation is just not compelling enough to like it, do something even as minor as hold your phone at an uncomfortable angle. Like, no, I really don't want to do this. I'll just do it the old way, and I'll be happier. 
So augmented reality has a massive hill to climb uh, in terms of, of usability. And I think it's not on the rundown, but Joe, I think, wrote about that just this week, didn't he? Yes, I did, and whether or not we could have a new definition of augmented reality and smartwatches somehow tie into that. Even though we're not seeing augmented reality through a traditional smartwatch, could we augment our reality by giving us information on our wrist? It is a, a very cool uh, article, and I am very much looking forward to diving into it. I'm sorry we don't have the time to on the show right now. But there, go read it, listeners. There is a lot go of read it. Really it's cool on a website that you know. I'll pluck it now. There, there is a lot of cool augmented reality stuff out there. Like I remember when I wrote for Phonebook that there was a, a piece that I wrote that was about um, it was a GPS app for smartphones that you would put your phone in a dock and it would use the camera to show you where to go using like real world stuff. So if you're going to a McDonald's, it would put like a McDonald's logo or symbol on your GPS, and, you know, it was just really cool. It's hard to explain um, just off the top of my head here, but they, they've done some really cool stuff with it, and the fact that some of it hasn't taken off is kind of upsetting. I'm really curious to see where this Samsung uh, headset thing that got leaked is going to lead us to. If that's actually a real product, that looks really cool, because one of the things that had... So if you're not familiar with this, it's like the uh, the Google Cardboard thing that launched at I.O. It's basically just the holder for your phone that straps onto your head, phone slides into it, so it gives you a high-depth display, splits down the middle, and uses lenses to give you a you know, 3D effect. Uh, but there's a button you can press to see through it with your phone's camera, sort of opening up the door for augmented reality stuff. So it, it is this, make uh, it accessible I, I imagine, to people. I don't know if it's going to I imagine to be... this thing is pretty stylish and like kind of awesome looking, right? <laughs> it's going to look as cool I'm as waiting a virtual boy. I'm waiting for the punchline, and I think the punchline is when you see somebody actually wearing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It looks now, like the, uh, this old like virtual reality game that I had that was probably about five dollars from the Dollar Tree when I was like six <laughs> years old. It was the worst thing it was a golf game. It was awful. It was horrible. <laughs> let's uh, let's 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 take it back to to slightly more uh, or less you know vaporific products if if we can. <laughs> I want to mention that we're going to have more on the Fire Phone uh, next week. Um, not. Uh, not a specific date and time for you, but we will be talking more about the Fire Phone next week. We're not done with that yet, don't worry. And if you want to pre-order one, uh, the, the, we have the link in our hands-on posted pocket now, right now. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the OnePlus One, which we did cover a little bit in, in last week's episode, and we've kind of been batting it around a little bit, but immediately after last week's Pocket Now Weekly went live, we published our OnePlus One review from guest editor Chris Larson. Uh, a review that I think turned out quite well, and uh, one in which the phone actually did quite well itself. We got an overall score of uh, nine. No, excuse me, eight point nine, which is, uh, you know, I think higher than I expected. Uh, and then we we sort of used this opportunity uh, to cross promote the latest edition of the giveaway, uh, which is Stephen's department. So I, I think Stephen, if I'm not mistaken, we have a winner to announce, don't we? That we do. Uh, so we started this last latest contest on Monday, giving away an invite good towards a 64 gigabyte OnePlus One purchase. Had a flurry of activity all week long, and uh, entries closed last night. We have ourselves a winner. So let's find this dude here. Well, Stephen finds the Martin can't win. What? Very ready on the drum With roll. No further ado, drum roll. Ready? Drum roll activated. Lucas Pichel of apparently Germany. You had yourself a one plus one invite. Congratulations. Congratulations, Lucas, on getting your invite. Yeah, I, I was stunned at this because people, uh, there were about a thousand entries based on the comments I see on the on the review right now. And uh, despite all the stuff that we kind of crap on OnePlus 4, for, rightfully so, for its kind of bungled uh, introduction of this product, it's, there are still a thousand people, at least a thousand people out there who are who will enter a contest just for the chance to buy it. This is a good for, for this thing. Yeah, man. And you know, having played with Chris Larson's a couple times, I see I do see why. I mean it's it's more impressive than I thought it would be and it's uh it deserves a lot of the praise it gets. So And for those of you who are still hungry for a OnePlus One and who are not Lucas, uh, be sure to check back in on Monday when we have our next giveaway coming up and we have another OnePlus One invite. So we didn't win this time. I will next week. Yay! I like this soundboard. But it's, it's not, not OnePlus, it's Oppo. 
Ooh. Oh, yeah, didn't we do the whole conspiracy thing last week? I feel like, yeah, we've, we've, we've been there. Absolutely. The one the ground we've trod before. Joe, as the Android guy, I should ask you before we move on, are you uh, at all excited by the OnePlus One, or is this not your wheelhouse, really? Uh, I'm excited about what it stands for. Um, I think it still needs to mature a little bit. I'm interested in what their second-generation device is going to be before I get too excited. No question about it. A, a sensible stance to take. And before we get away from the giveaway completely, I want to tell Stephen or ask Stephen um, if you've thought about rebranding our, our giveaway efforts based on the new information we're getting. Right. Not so much the month of giveaways, but let's call it the summer of giveaways, perhaps. <laughs> exactly right. Because every time we have a new, we like schedule, every time we implement a new giveaway, uh, we stumble into another opportunity to do yet another one. So... We have several stacked up after the original month of giveaways is completed, mm -hmm. and at this point, we're just going to be giving stuff away all summer. So that's it. May awesome. become the half year of giveaways at this point. <laughs> we're still uh, feeling that out. Which I don't know if that's, that's okay with you guys, but I'm totally fine with it. So let's keep this uh, ball rolling. I'm Amen. only cool with it if I win something at some point. I don't care if it's like a little piece of piece of paper. I don't care. I just want to win something. I'm going to see like that. 70 sock puppet accounts with variations <laughs> on it. Mailer Tartan, do <laughs> inappropriate post-it notes from Michael Fisher. Well, yeah, yeah there you go. You can win a collection of yeah of post-it notes from review phones that I've sent you. <laughs> now we'll oh, get you a new have... hat, Taylor. That's what you need most of oh, all. What? I don't Absolutely. feel good right without you having a hat on. I'm still not over it. Can you get still me wrong. one of those like visors with the hair in it? <laughs> I I, absolutely. We can work it out. Uh, to, to, we're going to bring back the thought thread this week, folks. We haven't had it in a week or so, and uh, this one is, is just kind of a bit of fun. This is not going to launch us into anything contemplative. It's just something to acknowledge that we were a part of a, a short-lived Internet phenomenon for like 18 hours. Uh, sound the bell for the thought thread, please. Thank you. I'm supposed to look the other way so that you think there's an assistant over there, but I just looked at the wall, and now <laughs> the game is up. <laughs> Our whole apart. illusion of professionalism is, is shattered. Just, just to preface this thought thread, <clears throat> this is yeah. Michael's version of a humble brag on his own, pocket, on his own podcast. No, it is No, it is not. <laughs> it is not at all. Uh, well, maybe a little. Is, it's quite the opposite. This is me accepting responsibility for a lot of inconvenience. Okay. <laughs> Listener uh, Marvis Rivas kicks us off with a question relevant to our interests on the thought thread. He says, one thing I'm starting to find annoying is the command, wait for it, OK Google. Now we wait for everybody to get back on track. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm watching tech reviews and you hear it two to five times in a video, Google now activates every single time. Do you think Google will let you change this command later on? Marvis Rivas. And the reason that we bring this up, this is a good question, Marvis, and it's very relevant because what happened this past week is I was doing a lot of Android Wear reviews, and um, one of the things you can say to Android Wear, I'm not going to say it again because it's just annoying, is, uh, is the say trigger what? phrase. Okay. No, I'm not, no, no, Joe! <laughs> no, the, the trigger phrase, is, as Joe just mentioned, is, you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't have an, I don't have a quick synonym, but... Uh, it, it's okay, it Google. It, thank you. <laughs> and it triggers the voice interface, and now we're losing we're losing viewers by the bucket load. And uh, if you were watching any of the Android Wear reviews on a mobile device or on a TV and your mobile device was near and you have uh, K Google everywhere enabled, <laughs> it will trigger the phone. And if you're watching it on the if you're watching the video on the phone, the phone will stop and wait for a command because it'll pop up the interface. So a user, uh, I think also Marone, um, uh, recorded this happening in like a 10 second video that was then picked up by Reddit and it landed on the Reddit's front page for like <laughs> 10 hours or something like that. So uh, I was reported on a, this week in Google over at Twit and a bunch of other people mentioned it and I was just like, oh, this is, this is great. And thanks to everyone who left the link to the original video <laughs> in their cross posts. But yeah, so this is a good question though. I mean, don't you want to be able to change your key phrase? If you've been listening to this podcast for the full length of the podcast, then you know my position on the matter. I want to be able to say, you know, computer, and have the thing wake up. You know, I want no, to be able you, to program. You want to use some it. sort of random Star Trek nerdy quote. That is that, is that is that is exactly what. I, yeah, computer. Yeah. Oh, was that it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you you've got to use a Scottish accent and speak into a mouse <laughs> while you're saying it. Hello, computer. <laughs> Hello, <Yes>. computer. <laughs> well, I mean, this I isn't think... just a, a Google. Problem. I mean, this is happening with the OK Google keyword, but the people, uh, Xbox One gamers, are having the exact same issue where 
they'll inadvertently say things, they'll hear a commercial or something, it'll wake up the Xbox. This is like, as voice control becomes a pervasive part of electronics, this is going to happen all the time. We don't need right. a Google solution, we need some you know, broader way to combat this. And this is an exact, or a perfect example of how. Um, Taylor's holding up the Moto X, having forgotten Moto that X. most of our listenership is not watching this right now. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> because it's programmed to my voice. So if you say, okay, Google, my stop. phone doesn't come up. <laughs> we have to stop doing it. Now that we've acknowledged that it is annoying, <laughs> we have to actually stop doing it. What are we, what are we going to say Just instead? say the key phrase. Just say just say the, the, the trigger the phrase. The key phrase. Yeah. The key phrase. So, but, so if you but say... Taylor, I will take issue with you on that because, the, yes, the Google X the, <laughs> the, uh, program to only respond to a certain user, but it's not. I, other people set off, okay, Google, nah, other people set <laughs> off the, the key phrase all the time on my Moto X, so it's like well, whatever. Well, I've had one person set off mine, and I've set off another guy's, but it's <laughs> not like my sister Sorry. could come up and say the key <laughs> phrase and, you know, my Moto X wake up. It's only when I do it or a random few people who kind of sort of sound like me can, mm. can wake up my Moto X. So it's different. Yeah, but the point is, if everybody went the ZTE route and let you program whatever your own trigger phrase, then the life would be so much, not just more convenient, okay, yes, but it would be fun, too. I mean, you know, what do you say? You want to call your phone Lucille, whatever. It's like, yep, yo, Lucy. And it's like, oh, boom, there we go. Like, cool. Is there, like, a branding component of this? Is it important to Google that we're saying this every time and it's so being important. reinforced? Absolutely, oh, yeah. which is I, was, I think, a big reason. Actually, they said was a big reason for... Yeah, implementing the now at the end of the key phrase for Moto X because they they wanted uh, they were still pushing for Google now to be a uh, to, to they were pushing for the expansion of that brand at the time and they that was that factored into that consideration, but you know let, let us choose our own key phrase. I don't want to be I'm already a walking billboard. Your logo is already on my device. The carrier's logo is right next to it, and I let me let me call my phone what I what it what I want. You know, it's better than than the Oppo version, which is Hey Snapdragon. That's actually what's on the OnePlus and on the Oppo Find 7 and Find 7. You've got to be kidding hey, me. Snapdragon. Snapdragon. I kind of like yeah. that. It sounds like an indie song. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Snapdragon. <laughs> it, only worked, it only worked like one out of every like ten times for me. So I wow. didn't even talk about it in the review because it just wasn't even worth talking about. Wow. When we did a, uh, a, was it a video or just an article on how to enable the key phrase everywhere? And there's a uh, three times training that you've got to use. So I think Google's probably moving over to more listening to and identifying your voice versus somebody else's. That's probably the direction they're headed more than custom key phrases. But I, I have to admit, I'd love a custom key phrase, but I think people would probably abuse it. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't mind one. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. I'm just saying maybe a key phrase that's trained to your voice. That's two sets of authentication there. They're, they're very yep. big sets of authentication, but, I mean, what are the odds that somebody's going to also have the same key phrase as you and have a similar voice? None. I mean, it's that, got to be pretty loose enough. recognition because our voices change on a day-to-day -day basis. You wake up in the morning, you're a little, you know, hoarse in the throat versus you know, when you're oh, fresh sounding. It's got, it has to be flexible. Well, it doesn't go just on sound. I think it's on, like, the frequency. Oh, intonation and, and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like the actually speed, intonation is the, is the next thing because like I, I need my phone. I think there are some call-in services like for banks and whatever when they're supposed to be intelligent. I think there are some services already using some technology to determine the level of um, <laughs> irritation uh, you're you're no. addressing. It with. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, exactly. No. no, representative. Re I said no, no. Close, no. close my account. Yeah, Comcast. right. Shut <laughs> the, the best I'll get someone to assist now. you, but first I need to know a little more. No. The best one is when you're like on the phone and it's it's saying you can speak or type your answers. You're trying to type your answer and then your friends are on the other side of the room talking really loudly and every yeah. time you go to press uh, a button, it starts over from the start, like the very beginning. We can go back and forth on this forever, but it is time. Uh, we're a half hour into the show, so it's time we learned about the news of the week. It's a shorter news segment than usual because we have a longer listener mail segment than usual and I want to let everyone know that I had the Q&A panel closed for the first part of the show. Now it's open. Now we see your, your live comments. We'll be getting to them as the show goes on, but Stephen... Why don't you usher us in to news? Sure, sure. Uh, well, first things first, big news from Microsoft this week, and not great news for a lot of people. 
So after Microsoft went to the trouble of bringing on Nokia's devices and services and those thousands and thousands of employees, now it's decided, well, maybe don't need so much of you and has announced a pretty substantial wave of layoffs. Uh, something like 18,000 people of various roles will be losing their jobs. And as a part of this uh, new direction for the company, not really new direction, it's new uh, refocusing of efforts, uh, the Android line of Nokia products we saw, starting with the Nokia X, XL, now the X2, doesn't sound like it's going to be continuing. Um, one of the uh, notices sent out by uh, Stephen Elop to his employees uh, says that select future or select Nokia X devices that have been in development are going to be repurposed as uh, new low end affordable Lumia models. It doesn't outright say in this public memo that the line is just dead in the water, uh, but a leaked one that followed up sort of sends the point home a little clearer that there is not a future for this at Microsoft. It is going to be Windows Phone all the way. So, so that's it's kind of good and bad news depending on how you feel about Windows Phone in the first place, I think. It's bad news. It's no, bad. it's not bad news. It's, so, it's okay, bad. I, I was going to say, this this story that we're referencing is is really bad news for the 18,000 people who are laid off, yeah. obviously. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, and it's not just a significant of force Nokia. reduction. Yeah, it's it's not just a significant force reduction. It's like a it, the, the I think the biggest one in Microsoft's history. I think their next biggest one was in two thousand nine when when they laid off nine thousand people or something like that. So this is didn't didn't Microsoft yeah. say like immediately after it announced that it was going to acquire Nokia that the people at Nokia would keep their jobs? I don't think so. I don't have any reference for that. I mean, no, no, no company would outright come out, come out and say like, because as we've said on the show before, when you buy another company, particularly another big one, you know, it's like you don't need two payroll it's departments. Like, this yeah. is the natural like flow of this is part of the synergy that makes a merger financially, uh, you know, wise, uh, which sucks. But right. you know. So, but yeah, a lot of it, uh, the, a lot of the headcount does come from the Nokia well, group. Fifteen thousand, fifteen thousand yeah. people. That's a lot of people. Yeah, and yeah, a I lot of work with some Microsoft employees at my day job, and it got real quiet and a cloud over the whole Crickets. area for the last week. It's it's hitting everybody. There's some serious morality that's uh, or morale, rather, that's, uh, that's hitting. Well, yeah, they're they're. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the, the morale is just really, really take a hit, and this is in a group that's probably not going to be affected by by the layoffs. But nobody knows, and it's uh, it's very much uh, on everyone's mind. It could hit anyone. They don't know inside the company at the employee level who's going and who's staying. And it's interesting to try and divine some insight into how this factors into Microsoft tactics, because I obviously we knew there were going to be some redundancies that were. Eliminated, sadly, in, in terms of employee count. But how does this jive with uh, Satya Nadella's increased focus on, you know, things other than hardware? I think it was the Wall Street Journal that was saying this is this marks the the company's sharpest yet pivot from being a sort of devices and services company to being a, a, a cloud solutions like thing. And I, I, are you guys worried about uh, about the future of Windows Phone hardware? Uh, you know, under Microsoft now or what? Well, I'm not really. I mean, uh, in the, the memo that Elop set out, he referenced no longer making hardware for the sake of making hardware. But then at the same time, they're talking about how Microsoft wants to drive the Windows Phone brand. And we've seen a lot of efforts already this year bringing on new OEMs, especially in the low-end market. It wants to get away from this Nokia-only show. So I still think that by just refining its efforts at home to make Windows Phone popular, that may then sort of snowball and get more of these third-party companies interested and help build the brand up from the you know, sort of third fiddle position it finds itself in now. I certainly hope so. And I, the, the flip side of this is what you mentioned as well, Stephen, with this uh, thing that Joe and I are going to sharply disagree on. The discontinuation of the Nokia X uh, family could not have... Could not have um, Served as a better balm or a salve for someone stung by the uh, uncertainty, the new uncertainty of Windows Phone. I I hate the Nokia X. I hated it when we were giving it away. Uh, I was excited to initially announce we were giving it away, and then I got it, and then I was like, Oh my god! Oh, oh what a piece! Uh, but Joe, you had some fun with it. Yeah, uh, you didn't put Android on it. I mean, it sure it. Oh, had you flashed it the second you got it. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that one of the first. That count. That's why it was sent to me. That's why I sent it to Joe. In fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but but the point behind it is, it's it's very decent hardware, and it can run a real Android experience, and really without much of a any hesitation, either by putting a custom launcher on it or by rooting it and throwing all kinds of cool stuff at it. So. Sure, but- I, I, yeah, the, the internals are fine for that, Joe, and like it, it bears some semblance of Nokiaism in in the good way, in in terms of its uh, aesthetics. But the f- God, I I just hated holding the thing. It had those sharp corners, the battery door that wrapped around the front, and like some, you know, in a weird confluence of rounded corners and sharp corners right next to them. It reminded me of like sort of the the bad side of what Nokia would still be doing if if it hadn't gotten into bed with with Microsoft and I understand that a lot of people are sentimental about like Symbian and stuff and I'm like I know ne- I've never gotten it I've never understood it I you, a phone like that it arrives at my door and it, the only button on its face is a back button I'm just like I take this away from me I don't have any interest in yeah, yeah, I in I didn't like the button configuration but uh but... The battery shell and the the squarey roundy thing I thought was going to be great for durability because you've got all that extra area that's uh, shock absorption, basically. So when you you land it on its corner, you get a new shell, you snap it on, you're good. Um, it would be an excellent starter phone for for the younger kids and for people who are uh, a bit more active and no, damage their phones a lot. Visit? I mean, when you have the when you have the Moto E and the Moto G, more more importantly, and uh, to a lesser degree the Lumia 520 and now the Lumia 635. I mean, is that is there a place for the Nokia X? I just don't think there 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 is. It was always a weird a weird outlier to me in that respect because a 520 right yeah, operated I, better than it. It's weird, it's and right and that's not necessarily a bad thing if oh, if there's Taylor, a niche for it. Sorry, Taylor makes a good point with the Xiaomi uh, Redmi 1S as well, right? Mm-hmm. Almost, yes. it's got better specs than the Moto X or the Moto G, and it's about ten dollars cheaper, I think. Yeah. Yep. Well, anyway, it's uh, it's it's certainly not not the most joyous news that we uh that we've come across in the thing. Uh, and- before we uh, move on, it is worth noting that um, Microsoft has said they will continue to support the existing Nokia X Android models. So if you have one, you're not in awful shape right now. But Is, is that the same way Nokia said that it would support Mego on the M9? <laughs> we will see! <laughs> we yeah, shall I, see I was indeed. doing the history piece last week, and I found that piece where Nokia said that it was going to support Mego oh, well into the yeah. future. And it's just kind of like... Dead silence. <laughs> That's one of those things that happens, yeah. And you're you're kind of like if you if you look at the circumstances surrounding the Nokia X family and how how long it was not on the market and the reception it got and the probable numbers they're looking at as far as support goes, I you know none of that adds up to a fun story if you own one of these things. So regardless the of what they of say, anyway. what's that? The whole point of it anyway. Like it, like you factor in the fact that. Microsoft is building Android phones, and where does that make sense? Nowhere. It has never made any sense. Well, I mean, Microsoft was... makes money off of Android phones. Not a lot, but... Do they still make 10 bucks a handset on the licensing Something. fee? I thought that was over. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not happening, and thank goodness. <laughs> Done with that. Uh, <laughs> this is not something I want to dwell on, but just as a PSA, the, the Lumia Cyan update is headed out for Windows Phone 8.1 if you have a Nokia device, but not if you're on a U.S. carrier, because now we're still going to be waiting for ages. Like, I got so excited, yeah. and I, you know, I pulled out my 1020, I dusted it off, and I was like, Cyan! I'm like, oh, right, it's a carrier-branded unit, I can't mm-hmm. have that yet. Yeah. But Nokia has oh, that yeah, really that nice... Happen. Nokia right. has the really nice what, Stephen? Nokia has that really nice breakdown showing you know, what the status is for like, every country, every device, nearly carrier by carrier, so you can at least track how progress is coming along for your U.S. update, even if it's not available yet. That's true. And fun fact, the uh, Lumia Cyan update is required to make Nokia treasure tags work, and Nokia was just nice enough to send us some treasure tags the other day, and I can't make it work. Um, I tried to make it work on the 635, which does have Cyan on it, but unfortunately the SIM card that came with with that 635 is not activated. So there's a lot of logistical issues that we're kind of dealing with here. Yeah, we're going to have some more Nokia phone fun here. Nokia phone fun here soon. Uh, and I also don't want to dwell on this, but for a very different reason, because it's going to put me to sleep, but it's so significant that we have to address it. Um, Stephen, would you, and Joe, maybe, would you back Stephen up on this? Because I need to understand the historical context. I didn't know that Apple and IBM were crazy uh, competitive with each other and hated each other's guts. What's the story? 
I mean, back in the 80s, all of the, the companies on opposite sides of platforms were sort of at each other's throats. Sure. Either Microsoft or IBM versus Apple versus I think Commodore was still making, or Amiga, those four or five guys running Amigas at the time. But yeah, uh, these companies <laughs> never had that close a relationship. They're sort of always at each other's throats going after those early adopter computer users. Now, you know, 30-odd years later, IBM and Apple have come to an understanding. Apple's got this great uh, setup with mobile hardware. IBM wants to reach enterprise customers who now there's sort of this vacuum in the enterprise mobile space with BlackBerry sort of fading into obscurity in the background. So Apple and IBM are teaming up to deliver uh, enterprise solutions. IBM's going to use its uh, cloud stuff, its data analysis expertise to deliver a bunch of new apps for iOS, especially on the iPad. Uh, they're also going to be selling the hardware directly, and Apple's going to provide, you know, it has great customer support, so you sort of get the uh, best of both worlds. I'm not sure how successful it will be, especially considering the ever-increasing Android interest in enterprise services, but it's a, a step forward, especially for IBM, which needs to stay relevant in a market that it's kind of getting left behind in, so... Joe, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you've, uh, with some experience on the enterprise side of things. Yeah, so way back in the day, uh, IBM was very, very, very conservative. Uh, even their dress code. Uh, you, you were suits and ties, and you were a black suit, not a navy suit, because they could tell the difference. And <laughs> you had to wear garters to hold up your socks, and if you didn't, there were people who would go and check and send you home if you were not in the appropriate attire. Is this like IBM in the 60s or the 80s, though? Uh, well, not... It's it was still pervasive even even into the 80s, but we're talking. That's interesting. It, it was a very very conservative culture, and uh, even down to the the dress and the attire, the attitudes especially. And then you've got Apple, which you know back in this back in the 80s. Let's just go back that far. Um, they were very young. They were very new. They were fresh. They were anti everything IBM was. Building yeah. computers yeah. on like rumpled tie dye shirts in the back of a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's where the uh, that Super Bowl commercial came out, and the whole Think Different campaign was targeted specifically towards IBM and how you didn't want to be that person. You didn't want to have that stuff. You wanted to think differently, uh, so you could turn on a dime and not have all the bureaucracy of old men in suits running the company. Now, IBM is pretty much the same thing. They, they have very large servers, they have very large contracts, and they sell primarily to old men in suits. And, so, and that's not what, what we have today with, uh, with the mobile stuff from Apple. It's, it's definitely not men in suits that are using those products. And that's the generation that we're raising up. But isn't it isn't it increasingly that though? I mean, isn't Apple continuing to make like big inroads into the enterprise space? I mean, we just saw the Microsoft Office deal not too long ago. We see more oh, yeah, and more companies yeah. picking up, you know, bring your own device uh, policies specifically for the iPhone and buying iPads and iMacs and things of that sort. So it is isn't this a sign of Apple sort of getting? yet even more stodgy and even further away from that think different uh, culture. Absolutely, and the example that I'm reminded of is uh, George Lucas in the Star Wars megalo industry. Um, he got into movies because he didn't want to be everything that big movies were. Uh, he thought that it was destructive and it was all about commercialism and he wanted the art to drive his vision. And in order to do that, he came out later and said, I had to become exactly what I was trying to fight against in order to realize that vision. So apply that now to Apple. Apple, to, to make progress and get into this very large, lucrative industry of the enterprise, has to do exactly what they were fighting against, and that is to become those stodgy old men in suits. Now, hopefully some of that... Uh, some of that youth and some of that counterculture is going to come over into the boardrooms. I think we desperately need that to to push business forward, but that's more a, uh, a discussion on business than it is on what Apple's doing and how it's doing. The that's last thing that I... It is. Like, I mean, it it's is. just like frustrating. It's like I, I like unconventional thinking. I like I like small small fries and, you know, underdogs and things. And when you you get too big, it's like suddenly it's like, ah, well, now I have to play by a whole bunch of rules because just because of sheer scale. 
That's exactly. Sucks. Exactly. Well, the the last thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, IBM had their ThinkPad line, and they were very much into the mobile industry and the mobile space as far as uh, the business goes. The only thing they really oh, didn't okay. have was tablets and smartphones, and then they sold off ThinkPads to Lenovo, and Lenovo's doing great and wonderful things with them, and now they're... I, I wonder if this direction isn't uh, a little bit of heartburn in, uh, in getting rid of that division and seeing that that might have been a bad move. Yeah. I mean, this is certainly I, I, the ThinkPad has been a fixture in my life because my, you know, a, a family member works in a sales business and they, they always get uh, Lenovo ThinkPads. I mean, and he, he gets one about every two weeks because he manages to break it somehow. <laughs> but uh, it's not easy to break one of those things, and he but he manages it. But that's more a statement about him than it is about the um, about the ThinkPad because they're solid pieces of hardware. So. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, tablets, Joe, and, and while we're talking about different form factors, I do want to move away from that because I, I, I will talk all day about corporate culture being boring compared to, like, fun culture, but, you know, no one telling you anything you don't already know. Uh, I want to hear I about another company. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about another company thinking differently in terms of form factors and what you can do with them in terms of, um, you know, novel ways of delivering entertainment. What the hell is happening, oh. Stephen? We're, we, you can only watch a movie trailer on a tablet if you're yeah. looking for one specific trailer right now. And if you want to see it before anybody else, yeah. So Samsung just launched its uh, Galaxy Tab S series uh, last month. These are the tablets that bring the OLED screens back to Samsung's tablet lineup. Uh, big Quad HD displays. There's the 8.4 and a 10. 5-inch model, uh, available now, the Wi-Fi only versions, um, but Samsung's trying to get some new interest in these, so next week, it's going to have the uh, world premiere of the trailer for Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1, the third of four entries in the series. Uh, it's going to premiere at the San Diego Comic-Con next Friday. We'll be showing this off on the Tab S. And the day after that, on Saturday and throughout the whole weekend, you'll be able to stop by the Samsung Experience Shop that's in select Best Buy stores and check it out on the Tab S there in person. Then presumably it'll be all over the Internet and you can see it anywhere. But if yeah. you stop by one of those Samsung shops, you can pick up a free pass to the movie when it finally comes out this fall. So, so that's if you're a Hunger Games fan, go check it out. Like this seemed like a little, kind of small fry stuff at first glance when I saw it in my in my inbox, but then I was like, no, wait, this is kind of like a cool thing. This this vaguely resembles the future that I that I at one point anticipated, where it's like, wow, some like not only can I watch movies on my tablet, that's like old hat now, whatever, but like a new movie that's coming out, I can well if I want to see the trailer for it. And by the way, trailers are always forty times better than whatever movie they're advertising. Yeah. Ooh, if I, yeah. <laughs> you know, if I want to see that, then I have to watch it on a specific tablet. I think this is a savvy move on Samsung's part. Yeah, it's gimmicky, but I mean, whatever. It's Samsung. I think it's if, going to be effective too, because it will draw attention to a line that is otherwise not getting a lot of love. We talked about this at the AT and T hands-on, Stephen, where yeah, it's like yeah. Stephen's like, "Are we covering these?" I'm like, "What are these things?" We we put all the effort into doing a review on a tab product, and frankly, the audience just isn't there. To, to justify the effort, so it's like well, nobody cares. Okay. So it's a nice way to get anybody, people interested. Is anybody reminded of uh, going back to Star Wars here? What Lucas Arts did with if you wanted to watch the new teaser or the new trailer for any of the the Star Wars movies, you had to do it on Apple's website and you had to have QuickTime to be able to watch it. Uh, I mean, that's that still frustrated me to no end being you know, a PC guy because I want to watch this and now in order to do it, I've got to yeah. go to their website and I have to download this special software on my computer to be able to do it. Just let me watch it on these other platforms. I don't have to do it using that. And, and now we're doing the same thing but to a specific hardware line. This to me is frustrating more than anything. But it's it's not even it would be one thing if they were making this available to everyone who has a Tab S, like you use some Samsung movie app and you can watch it. That's not what they're doing. It's just going to be in these stores. So it's kind of just you know showing it off to advertise the product rather than making it available to yeah. a certain subset of users. It, it is a really weak sauce implementation of that. Sorry, Taylor, what were you going to say? I was just going to say it's clever. I don't like it, but it's clever because it gets people <laughs> who want to see the trailer before anybody else into a store looking at that tablet. Yeah, Whether, right. Nobody's going to want to buy it just because they're having to watch a trailer on this tablet. They're going to go out of their way to watch the trailer and then they get a free pass and then leave. 
but yeah. it's still... But it's so my, important, because it gets them to thing. see the thing in yeah. real life. And with these OLED displays, it's really hard to convey the difference between that and an LCD when you're looking at these screens through another screen. You really need to check it out in person. So this is a good way to uh, you know throw that hook out there. Yeah, no, it's it's true. I, I think I think it's clever, and that's why I, I asked for it to be included in uh, in the in today's today's news dump. So Happy thank to you. Uh, let's talk about um, some some hardware that uh, you know I I was never that excited about, but it, apparently it's running for such low prices now that we can't help but notice them. Who is this? Expansis, Stephen, offering some Google Play edition hardware for on the cheap. Yeah, uh, this sort of came out of nowhere. Um, so. A little earlier this month, Google knocked three of the existing uh, Google Play experience, Google Play experience, Google Play edition devices out of the Play Store. Uh, these were ones from last year. It was the original HTC One, the Sony Z Ultra, and what was the third? Uh, the LG GPad 8.3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so these were no longer available for sale in the uh, the Play Store, which is kind of weird because those last two only showed up in December, so they very short lifespan. But can't buy them from Google anymore. Expanses has them, and really cheap too, like Nexus level prices. Now, was always the problem with Google Play editions is, yeah, you get the Nexus experience, but you're paying, you know, six hundred dollars out of pocket for a, a full-on flagship smartphone. So now you can get, I forget what they have the Galaxy S4 now for. They also all the Galaxy S4 still. That one's not discontinued, but it's part of the deal. And uh, pull up these prices here, but they're uh, really they affordable. Like I'm the, looking at the the Z Ultra and trying to talk myself out of it because yeah. I had a very tasty experience with on, that on Swappa the other day. I was like, because their their Z Ultras are all over Swappa. Like people are selling these like crazy, and uh, I really wanted one because yeah, Taylor, you and I, I know you didn't have a great experience with it, but I thought it was kind of a cool. It was like a mini tablet Z in my hand. I'm like, oh, cool. Well, yeah. The problem I had is that it didn't fit in my pant pocket. <laughs> yeah. Pants pocket. Yeah. It, it, it yeah. literally it jabbed me in the stomach. Pants pocket. Yeah. But just get back to Jinkos, man. But I was also upset Overall. because the one that I had was a a European model, and I only got Edge on it. So I got Ooh. this very tainted yeah. experience. God, yeah, that's a horrible time. No. Yeah, and I was yeah, just welcome upset. to my world. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to that's try another one. All the phones I ever get to review <laughs> for three fifty. If, if this is still available come August, I might I might pick one up just to see, and then. Hmm. I, yeah, it's, telling how long it'll last. I just checked earlier today, and all four are still in stock. But yeah, it says a hundred in stock, a hundred plus in stock. Okay, so I, I have, and I have that might go fast. Yeah, and well, very likely to do so. Well, maybe the, I'll uh, sell something. I've got some phones to sell. <laughs> you, got two you can spare one, right? Uh, actually, t- while we're while we're uh, talking to Taylor, while we have Taylor um, and and while we have Taylor's jaw flapping. Uh, I want to talk to you about this, Taylor, because you are kind of like the closest thing we have to an erstwhile BlackBerry superfan. And <laughs> BlackBerry just got some shade thrown at it by Blackphone, who we will be uh, talking more about in the coming weeks. Uh, we, we are going to cover Blackphone fairly extensively for anybody who's, who's wondering, because uh, security is sort of a, a major part of the conversation these days, and it's important. Um, kind of important, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, apparently, Blackphone was interviewed in uh, what what publication was this? Uh, I had it a second ago, and then it sort of disappeared on me. Damn. I don't know. Yeah, I'll keep looking. It's actually it's like it's in the story, and I can't see it. Anyway, um, the the point is, Blackphone was responding to a to a sort of a BlackBerry comment, um, <laughs> critical of them, and. Uh, uh, Blackphone's statement was essentially, you know, Rem abandoned its its old stuff and it, it caved to government pressure to turn over your user information, and that is something that is unconscionable. And you know, we 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 don't do that. And oh, and by the way, uh, BlackBerry's drop in uh, market share is is massive, and uh, basically, like BlackBerry sucks. Sucks to be you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but my question for Taylor in this kind of like strangely angled section of the news is, uh, I mean, how accurate do you feel it is? I mean, how how, how much of BlackBerry's woes are related to its, uh, to its lack of security and how much of it is just the fact that they forgot how to make consumer products and stuff we've talked about a long time ago? I think, I think it's very heavily skewed towards the latter. 
Um, Blackberry was always adamant about maintaining its security, and I, I can't comment on whether it gave up information to the government or how it did that or whether it was pressured. I can't comment on any of that. I have no knowledge of any of that, but I can speak from the perspective of someone who is a huge BlackBerry fan, and you can ask any of my friends in real life. I never, I always said that I would never give up my BlackBerry. I would always, always use a BlackBerry over anything else. Now, those comments were <laughs> clearly very short-sighted, but um, yeah. But you haven't yet redacted them. Oh, I have. <laughs> I have like, <laughs> Publicly. Uh, Many times. Yeah. Um, BlackBerry just, they failed to innovate fast enough or, or quickly enough to keep up with what else or whatever, like what all of its competitors were doing. Yeah, but it's interesting that the one thing, like the one uh, stool leg they were still leaning on this whole time was like, yeah, well, that's, that iPhone's pretty be cool, but is it as secure? Go with Blackberry if you want secure, and then they basically just caved when when the government uh, governments of various countries came and knocking. Yeah, but and I find it I sort of find that complaint a little disingenuous because I don't think Blackberry was ever advertising. I may be misinterpreting the situation here. I don't think it was ever talking about real end-to-end -end user security like we're seeing with Blackphone because Blackberry itself could always. I mean, it had the encryption keys. It could see these messages. So whether it's BlackBerry doing it or some Middle Eastern government, your communications were always open to a third party there. So no, I think you're right, and I think this dovetails nicely with what we were saying before about when you're when you're little. Like, of course, Blackphone can come out there and say that he can be brash and just be like, "Hey, by the way, you suck at you suck at your job." We've never had a problem like that. It's like, so yeah, you haven't been in the business. Like, like your phone yeah. just launched, right? So they can say whatever they want. They can come out and be like, "Hey, we're chal You you are in our crosshairs." Obviously. Oh, and by the way, you and you dogged us. So, okay, here's here's how you fail. You suck even more than most people think. Here's how we don't suck. Boom. Buy this phone. I think that's you know. Um, it's it also savage, but it's it's good tactically speaking. It's sound. Yeah, Tyler. Black phone also has not been under serious pressure from all nations around the world about right. security. Right. Um, but I, I remember specifically, and I don't remember what country it was, but it was a Middle East country that was pressuring BlackBerry to give its information, you know, decrypt messages and stuff. And I remember it completely pulled out of that country for a while. Uh, this was back in, like, 2008, 2009 or something. But BlackBerry was uh, like, didn't, we don't do that, and backed out. Like, stop they, selling their phones didn't there. They then, uh, I think they put a data center over over there just to, to help yeah, do just, that. So that. Oh, yeah, wasn't it? So they, they could, was Saudi Arabia. UAE. Was Here we go. Uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Uh, someone over there. Yeah, yeah. They, but they, they did that specifically so that uh, that country would be okay with sending data through a data center, which is how BlackBerry works, um, and have that not be under the purview of the United States government. So they said, well, we can't do that right now. Pull out and put a, a data center over there specifically for that purpose. Now, whether or not that's a viable solution anymore now that we know that the NSA has been spying on all but four countries. Uh, I don't know, but at least it got them back into the country, right? Right. Uh, and if you, well, we're going to talk more about this uh, a little later on when we're, I just wanted to throw it in there as, as, a, as another reminder that we're going to be covering this a little bit more heavily as we go forward. But if you want to get away from all cellular networks, uh, you just don't oh, trust man. any of them, or you're in a major... Uh, you know, weather disaster, or you uh, are in an area where the cellular networks just aren't very good, and you want to talk to one other person or a couple other people, Gotenna has you covered. This is cool as ish. It's so cool that yeah. several team members emailed me at the same time when I think CNET <laughs> reported on this first, and we're like, can we get one of these? I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I'm busy. Oh, yeah, this is very cool. Yes, I will ask. It's very uh, cool in like a tinfoil hat kind of way. <laughs> no, but it's not, it, I, you know, it's not really about avoiding uh, surveillance or anything like that. It's about like... It's not staying off the grid. It's making a new grid. Right, exactly, yeah. It's like... Um, I think that there, counts. There is some, some economic benefit. So what is it? Steve, why don't you tell us, uh, Stephen, what this network architecture is like on this little... This little device. So the GoTenna, it's a BlackBerry accessory. BlackBerry uh, <laughs> accessory. You can only use it with a BlackBerry Q10. Yeah. Right. Tuna. Oh, Limited no. user interest there. Uh, it's a Bluetooth accessory. Connects to your iOS or Android device. And uh, what it's for is when you can't have, you don't have any cellular signal. There's no Wi-Fi available, either because there's no towers out there. They're saturated. They're down. Whatever. You still need to get in touch. So your phone communicates to this GoTenna accessory. 
which is its own our radio transmitter. It works on a lower frequency band than almost every cellular signal out there, down in uh, the 150 megahertz range. So the signals propagate really well. Uh, so even without a central tower, you can just connect user to user from I mean, a couple miles in OK conditions. If you're really high up in clear view, 10, 20 miles they're saying you can get. And then the idea is that if a bunch of people who all have their own go antennas, you can send messages out to individual users, you can send them out to the group, uh, you can share GPS coordinates. It's just a way to keep in touch with other smartphone users when there's not an you know, overall overarching network connecting you. It should make your own out in the field. So if you're camping or something, it sounds like a good way to keep the family together. And it's not too expensive. At least the pre-orders now, they're selling a meta 150, and you get two then. Uh, so you have a couple people or four of them or something. Uh, it's going to be a little more pricier when it finally hits uh, full sales. They're going to be 300 for a pair. But if it sounds good, you can you know pick one up now, get your pre-order in, and uh, save a bunch of money on it. This reminds me of a feature that was built into a lot of Motorola handsets back in the Nextel days when uh, if, you know Nextel had the network-based Direct Connect walkie-talkie. But if the you were not, stuff? well, yeah, but if you were not within network coverage, uh, there was oh, a backup radio built really? in that operated around yeah, I think 900 megahertz. I might be wrong on that. Don't quote me on it. And uh, it allowed just straight up line of sight communication. It was like having a, a digital two-way radio built yeah, in. Yeah, like one of those GPRS phone. family things. Exactly right, and uh, it was it was terrific, uh, and it was great for shopping malls or something like that, oh, or anywhere neat. where where IDEN coverage was kind of lacking, which was you know a lot of places in the country. IDEN was not a very big network compared to what we have now, and uh, it was a very cool thing. But this doesn't require you to have a separate phone for that. You pair your phone via Bluetooth to the GoTenna module, and you and it runs through that. I think it's a it's a very very innovative way to solve a, a problem that, granted, we might not have all the time, we may not have in all areas, but for people who are you know, and like, I don't know, some back with like, I don't know, Utah or something. Yeah. This sounds, you know, pretty impressive. <laughs> the one thing that would make it really a uh, more complete solution in my mind if this was based around some sort of standard. Like if GoTenna could do this, if other accessory makers could do it, and they would sure. all talk together. It limits it a little bit, but, you know, this is the first generation I'm willing to... Yeah, it's not, it's not even FCC approved yet, so I mean, yeah, this is still... Yeah, I was worried about that for a second. That's a big problem, yeah. too. It's like 151 to 155 megahertz, and the back of my head's like, isn't that the emergency band? I just checked, no, that's 121.5, so... Yeah, 150 ain't too far away from, like, you know, the upper end of the FM band, you know. You just, like, tweak this thing a little bit, and, you know, broadcast. It's like, you're listening to the lunch hour on 150.1. <laughs> Joe, are you going to get one of these out there in Utah? Uh, I'm really interested in this, uh, not necessarily for an out-of-the-box purpose, but for a possibility for uh, like a ham radio mesh network thing. Because us hams, we got privileges in different areas, and we can pump power through it. So if you could take this and set up a mesh. (laughs) I want a T-shirt that says that. I got privileges in different areas, and I can (laughs) pump power through it. (laughs) Joe, do you have a ham license plate? Yo, do you have your uh, we plate? have two ham plates in my uh-huh. family, yes. Of course you do. Yes, I do. <laughs> That's so awesome. KF7 NWA. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Hail me on that band. And my wife, I I shouldn't be saying this, but my wife is uh, KG7EEZ. So the right. joke is that she's extra easy. But I will punch <laughs> any guy in the face who says that. <laughs> hey, but no, um... Uh, one of the cool things that you can do with uh, with those frequencies is they do propagate pretty darn well uh, over distance. Um, I was at a, a Boy Scout camp with my son a few years back, and they don't have any anything up there at all. And the way that they were able to do that was uh, they ran essentially an ISDN line over 900 oh. megahertz, uh, and they're throwing it 35 miles to get out there. And with internet, <coughs> excuse me, with internet technologies, they've got uh, an ISDN phone line out there where you can literally, they've got different VoIP lines, you can pick up the phone, hear a dial tone, and dial a phone number to anybody in the world out in the middle of nowhere. There's no At electricity, there's no second. network. Well, yeah, but it's enough that you can do voice telephone, and it's enough that uh, they have movie nights up there with the staff every night. They can stream movies in at uh, ridiculously slow speeds, but that's still the, awesome. the point that I'm making here is that this gives you a very nice prepackaged, battery included, antenna included, uh, relatively rugged looking device that if they can get mesh technology into that, 
you could take half a dozen of these and just hang them on trees, uh, hang them on houses, hang them wherever, like and repeaters. extend that network. And yeah, you'd have this personal area network that's a, a mesh. One of them goes down, you've got four or five other routes to get where you're going. That really then becomes viable, especially when you're talking about emergency communications. And if you wanted to get up someplace, uh, you know, get a command post set up to help look for a lost kid, going back to Boy Scouts, I guess. <laughs> really, really kind of cool. I, I like the package more than I like the technology more than uh, more than anything, I guess. When the zombies come, this is going to be really handy. I kitchen. was just going to say, oh, you've got to make sure and prep for the no coming idea. zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say that we did we do have a request I'm, in for I'm the eager. review unit, so once they're making these things uh, in quantity, yeah, uh, we're going to stop one up one way or the other. to sign off before they start shipping them out to anyone. Absolutely, yeah. I didn't realize they weren't yeah, going out, so I would have held off on that a little bit. But no, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it out, and we're not we're not really done. I, 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 and I know Taylor. This is going to come as a nice surprise to Taylor because he's very, very amped on this uh, nerdy radio talk. We're not quite done yet. <laughs> Taylor, are you you're going to stay <laughs> as excited as you are? No, I was reading up on it while you guys were talking because <laughs> I was, I was interested in some different things, like the range. It said it can go up to 50 miles, and that's, I don't know if that's repeating. Well, that's, like what that's line of sight. Person to person, crazy ideal. If you're like 500 feet up and you're yeah. over still water. Yeah, right. if you happen to be working a range of just yeah. one to one, you know, yeah. in, a, in a real world scenario, and it doesn't really say much about it. No, because it varies by terrain. I mean, this is the same like uh, shtick we had to give to everyone who was asking about direct talk. It was like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it could be ten miles totally, or it all could, it could be a quarter of a mile if, like, you know, you're inside a, a, a dump truck and you're being driven down an underground right. hallway. But the low frequency part well, makes a big difference. Mind, though, this is exactly yeah. why, like, the 700 megahertz LTE band is such a popular one because it yes. has so much more accessibility than the higher frequency 1900 megahertz. Right. right. There's that, and I was looking at battery life, which is two to three days or 30 hours if it's on the entire time. Mm. That's so this the, would be yeah. the, depending on how far you're going to be from home. If you're going camping or something like that, this would be a really nice thing to take with you. Leave one at home, take one with you, and you know just communicate back and forth if, if there's an emergency or something. But then you know I don't know if it's going to reach. So that's yeah, I feel like if you're kind of, only going, you know, 50 miles away from home for camping, there'll probably be cellular towers. Unless you live somewhere with no cellular towers to begin with. But. Well, some of the mountains here, no service whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, welcome well, to Utah. It's about time to move on to a uh, to another type of uh, radio technology, which is um, just I'm I'm gonna have so much fun with this. And before we go, if you're just joining us, we've had a lot of viewers join us uh, since the start of the show. We thank you, welcome, glad you're watching, and uh, we are gonna get to some of your Q and A's in just a little bit. But uh, if you're just joining us, quick reminder. The Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Swappa.com, where you can find gently used Android phones and tablets in case you're getting bored with the gear you currently have, which I know nothing about. I never get bored with what phone I carry, but you know. Go to swappa.com slash pocket now and tell them we sent you, please. Swappa.com. Uh, this is a seg... Man. This is a new segment, new segments, but never been broadcast before. It's about a, about a simpler time, about a time in our lives when we were younger, a little more trim. Maybe the uh, world was a little simpler. Maybe it just looks that way now. We don't know. A time... A time... Halcyon days. Yes, that appears to us through, through rose-tinted glasses as a wonderful, wonderful time when police sirens didn't necessarily interrupt our podcast. I'm sorry about that. But this is a segment about remembering. And this week's installment, motivated by uh, my appearance on the Untethered podcast with Taylor Martin and uh, Dustin, whose last name I always forget. Early. Early, last week. Sorry, Dustin. <laughs> Uh, it, it prompted a nostalgia binge about AMPS, also known as the Advanced Mobile Phone System, also known as the very first cellular network in the United States and, well, pretty much anywhere, the only proper cellular network. And um, I want to talk about it. Stephen and Joe, I figured this would sort of be be up your alley a little Great bit. Man. Again? Very excited. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I don't know if, I, I don't want to, like, you know, presume anything or anything like that. Did, did anyone have just a straight-up analog cell phone back in the day? Who am I, Zach Morris? <laughs> this is my question, because, I mean, I certainly was exposed to one. I, I had, There was a Dynatac in the house with its $8 per minute rates. Jesus. Man. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was never allowed to use it because my friends didn't get cell phones until like ninety eight, ninety nine ish, and then they were all PCS digital Nokia models. Everyone was playing Snake on them. Sure, sure, no, sure. No analog run-ins here. But that's okay because that, that that actually factors into what I want to talk about. What about you, Joe? Did you ever have an analog handset in the house? Uh, believe it or not, I did my research way back when and decided that analog wasn't my thing. Uh, there was a technology called GSM in the world. So I went with voice stream and a GSM network for my first cell phone and uh, pretty much have been with them ever since um, and voice laughed at all of my friends who had analog. Yes. Yeah, take, <laughs> became T-Mobile. Well, but, and, and Taylor, I think I know the answer from you because we, we've already talked about this, but you, you have, like, you didn't even know analog existed. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in diapers when analog was phased out. And uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> last had, week. <laughs> yes, I was in diapers last week. Um, no, I had a phone. It was a flip phone that would switch between analog and digital, but it, it was so long ago. I was like 14, I think. Uh, it just kind of slipped my mind. It was something that I, I wasn't really into technology then, so I didn't really pay <laughs> a lot of attention. So. Well, that's you, you know your specific example is exactly why this is still relevant to us because you know when I, I'm not just saying I want to talk about the old cellular network because I want to reminisce about the Dynatac and Zach Morris phones and eight dollar a minute rates once again, like. This was around in a really big way if you had a CDMA phone, if you had a Sprint phone or a Verizon phone, um, and some AT&T phones, but those were those were comparatively rare. If uh, Odds are if you were on Sprint in the early 2000s and you were roaming, you weren't digital roaming because Verizon still hadn't really given Sprint much love on that. You were roaming on analog, and so... Uh, if you were used to digital, and digital is still what we use, just for, for the most basic kind of interpretation, whether you're on an LTE handset or CDMA, GSM, or anything like that, you're using a, you're using a digital voice channel if you're having a voice call. And we've sort of been used to that quality uh, ever since, and we talk nowadays about things, uh, the coming revolution of uh, voice over LTE and, you know, HD, HD voice and that kind of thing, because we're tired of this crappy sound quality we've been putting up with for years, but... <laughs> Digital is really, really good compared to what analog was. Well, because... Analog could be good, but then it could also be really bad. Digital is a lot more consistent. You make a very good point. I'm sorry. Analog, if you had a good analog connection, analog would actually blow away digital because it, I believe the, the bandwidth is quite a bit wider, right? I imagine, yeah. Yeah, um, but the thing is, uh, <laughs> getting a good signal on analog was like, for me at least, uh, a, a, a laughable idea. Um, there was only one or two times when I didn't get a... Di I usually had my phone locked to digital only. I didn't want it to roam on analog because the way the analog network works is it does, uh, instead of code division or time division, it does frequency division. So every phone is assigned a different frequency. And it's always listening. The transceiver in the phone is always on instead of a digital network where it just checks every five seconds to see if it's being paged in a slot cycle. So that saves battery. So if you're on analog... Your old phone, which is a nice little Svelte digital flip phone, is beautiful. It had this big old antenna that you pulled out, <laughs> like a like a telephone, but like a oh, periscope, again. and that needed to be to be extended to it for it to work right. And even if you did that, the phone would get hot. It was always listening. The battery would die in about two hours. And if you you had to make a call, first of all, privilege more. It was like, oh, you're on analog. Oh, that's deluxe edition. Uh, that's twenty five cents a minute, no matter how many minutes you have in your plan. And also. <laughs> It was like trying to connect a call through a, a jury-rigged FM radio uh, in that same Volkswagen Beetle they were building the first apples in. Like, like that's that's how horrible it, it, an experience it was. The only time I really had to make a call and I really needed to get through was a time-sensitive thing. I was going to miss a ride. I was going to ruin the whole night. And this was college, so this was social stuff. Was important. It was important. It was really uh, very important. important. So I switch over to analog, and. I not only can't get through, and I not only have static based on which direction I turn my head, the static would change, I got crosstalk. So I heard someone else's analog phone <laughs> conversation on some 800 megahertz band. Yeah, I was like, what is this nonsense? So I, that, that's, that was my analog experience. The other failure is that analog was completely insecure. I mean, anyone with a radio that could tune to these bands could listen in. Congress had to pass a law prohibiting scanners from being able to pick up these bands just to prevent anyone from eavesdropping. This guy here, I got it because it was a pre-band scanner that can pick up all those analog bands. But I think even wow. to this day, they are prohibited from, even now that the 
bans are completely shut down, they still are uh, prohibited from selling devices that can pick this stuff up. I have a, yeah. a relevant news piece from the history thing I wrote earlier today. Yes. July 14th, 2009. Right. So this is uh, five years ago this week. Sprint was named the most reliable 3G network. Uh, wow. Wow. And, the, and there's a screenshot with this article of a speed test, 1.3 down, 0.27 up. Interesting. At least that's megabits, okay. though, right? Yeah. Now, if... If okay. you wanted to do <laughs> if you wanted to do, to do data on amps, you had to use it to to like connect a circuit switch acoustic, voice call. Yeah. You'd yeah, have an acoustic coupled modem that you nice. took it up to. Exactly. That, but no, Stephen, you make a good point about cloning the phones. I mean, yeah. you know, with digital, that's that's comparatively difficult to do, even though you, you can still do it. Right. But you not only could you grab the ESN, you could duplicate someone's phone with very right. little effort. Right. Because the, the, the procedure for initiating a call on analog called for the, the, the subscriber unit, the handset, to transmit its ESN in the open <laughs> at the cell site. So if you had a scanner or a, or a phone with the requisite hardware, you could read that ESN, duplicate it, and assign it to a phone of your choosing, and then the network w would have no way of knowing that you were not who you said you were, and it would bill. So you'd make a call to you know Okinawa or whatever, uh, and talk to your husband even for three hours. Local calls were ridiculously expensive. Oh, sure, yeah, even down the street, absolutely, you'd make any call and just bill it to you know Mr. Johnson down the road, and he would have no idea why his phone bill is eight hundred and fifty <laughs> bucks. These cell phones suck. And apparently, there was a device, and I had forgotten about this, and maybe one of you guys remembers it. There was a device called the Oki 900. Uh, it was a smartphone where if you didn't have a scanner like Steven, you didn't want to invest in the specialized equipment, you could buy this phone, this Oki 900, which was an analog cell phone, and it had the capabilities right out of the box. I don't think by design, but in any case, it did. To uh, it had everything you needed built into it to to clone another person's uh, ESN or use another person's oh, ESN. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like that the was holy grail feature. device to to get. Sorry, like, Joe. That was a feature. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. you can get a little digital radio uh, software radio tuner. Twenty dollars. Yeah. It'll pick up everything an analog cell phone ever would have been able to send. Wow. It's ridiculous how small and cheap this thing has gotten. And it is, it's, it's, it's crazy because, uh, you know, that this is, this has been shut down for a while, but I always used this as a, first as a sales incentive when I was working for one of any number of carriers that offered amps as a backup. I was like, yeah, if you're on a digital device, if you're on a GSM device, if you're like Joe, you've got a voice stream device, like, yeah, it's cool if you've got GSM coverage, but if you have no signal, you've got no signal. And that was the case with, mm -hmm. um, with IDEN, too, with Nextel, there was no roaming capability, so we were in the mountains of Vermont on a trip once, and my stepfather's Nextel is showing a solid red, and I, I, I took a lot of pride in this moment because he was always espousing the virtues of Nextel and making fun of me for having a sprint phone. I was like, hey, bro, I've got analog coverage. What you got? And, like, you know, I knew it was totally useless, but if I needed to make a 911 call, I could, and, you know, an, an all-digital unit couldn't, so... Speaking of 911, I, I, this might be apocryphal, but I believe one of the, the reasons that the analog band stuck a around as long as it did uh, wasn't necessarily because of the carriers, because those guys were switched, are quick to push people to switch to newer digital phones every time they're upgrading or stuff. It was OnStar in all these GM cars. That's the right. original ones were using the analog network. So until OnStar switched over to digital, a large portion of late-stage AMPS users were these cars, so for emergency services. That is correct. I do, I do not think that's apocryphal at all. I think that is exactly what, what, the, what the purpose was. And I can only imagine now, like, having been an OnStar subscriber, if, if I had a car back then with OnStar in it, like, having to deal with an analog connection when I'm trying to get something done through OnStar, no way, man. Forget it. So uh, just, a, just a, a little teaser here. We're going to cross into that a little bit, emergency use and uh, whatnot, on today's episode of the Pocket Now Power User. Oh, really? Ooh, teaser. Oh, very nice. That is a nice teaser. Well, before we get into listener mail, gents, thank you for indulging me on nostalgia. Does anybody else have any have any uh, memories, fond or not, about this period in cellular connectivity history? I have an old Radio Shack catalog I was looking for. All ah. my bathroom reading at the moment are magazines and catalogs that I left in a box at my mom's house when I moved out, you know, after I'm going to college. And she moved, I got the box of magazines, been going through them. It's like a 92 Radio Shack catalog. 
So all the phones in there are like shoulder host holster has like a big lead acid battery or something on there. Yes. It's a corded cellular phone. And of course it's like twelve hundred dollars and then again the service is, you know, forty dollars a day or something ridiculous. But now this is back when Radio Shack sold radios, right? Yeah. 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 Fun stuff. Now it's just batteries and well, cell phones yeah. still, but it's like eighty five percent consumer electronics and like fifteen percent a bin in the back with a resistor and a capacitor and you know <laughs> a, a spool of wire. I went looking for wire at Radio Shack. Dismal options, man. I don't know what to the shack is not back in any form. Uh, I hey, want I'm, to. I'm uh, going off camera here for just a minute. I, yeah. I, I got to show you this. It, it's Radio Shack and it's antennas. So hang, Ooh, hang on. I see All, right. Toys. All right. Well, Joe digs up uh, the toys, toys looking at. We have a, a couple Q and A items to take care of, and one of them yeah. is actually related to what we were talking about. This is from uh, Hua Vuang, and uh, Hua Vuang. I'm sorry. I uh, he's asking, uh, uh, hey guys, at pocket now. My question is, do you still think FM radio on a phone is still a must-have feature, especially when there's a power outage that takes down your cell tower? This is a good question, and I think it's really market dependent, don't you guys? Yeah, um, when they were launching Android One, one of the features that they mentioned at the keynote, they only made a few to make a real point about, but FM radio support was one of them for the, I guess, the Micro Max is going to be one of the first ones. So in India, this is a big deal. And I still think it is, I mean, it's not necessarily in demand in the U.S., but I would very much like to have it. Just the other day, I was lamenting the fact that my phone doesn't have an FM radio on it. Because it's yeah. all, I mean, if you're, if you're listening to the Spotify or stuff anyway, you know, we're, we're used to not necessarily having all our music on demand. We tune into a uh, internet radio station rather than a broadcast, but it's, it's you just turn it on, you listen, you tune out, it's, it's free, it's pretty high quality. I think sometimes yeah. people forget how good FM can sound. We're so digital obsessed. It's true, and if you, uh, it depends on your carrier too. If your carrier has really crappy reception in your in your corner of the city, yes, but this was my you problem. get a solid FM signal, then I couldn't why get not a Spotify data connection. I'm thinking I wish I had FM to listen to. There you go, and it is very. It's a handy gap filler in that regard, and also like in a nerdy way, it's a fun way to evaluate the uh, the prowess of your manufacturer. You know, when I was using the Moto E, I made sure to test the FM radio at length because it's going to be sold in markets where this is a really big deal. And it, oh my God, I couldn't believe how good it sounded. And I also couldn't believe how good it was at holding on to that signal compared to, say, uh, an HTC device that I had alongside it that also had an FM radio, which, you know, wasn't bad, but it was still like, man, you guys got nothing on Motorola radio building. So. The one thing that no one's doing, though, that I wish we would see is digital FM radio on phones, because these exist now, with HD radio, yeah, and sure. there are a lot of terrestrial units, you can get them in your car or stuff, but I've never heard of a phone that supports this. And well, that's because it carries. Well, it's not necessarily that are, but are audio quality or anything, but you get more stations in each market, so there's at least some value to it, but I yeah, think like the carriers, carriers are, are, are actively, this. yeah, disincentivizing that because they really don't want people not to hit their data caps, you know. That, that, I am get very that eager to believe each. that. Yeah. Uh, but, so, the, the, yeah, I think it's it's very relevant uh, for, for certain certain markets. And unless Taylor has something, I, I want to see uh, Joe's, Joe's antenna. What do you got there? Two meter or something? Hey, you're getting ahead of things. Um, so what, what I was going to say is FM radio uh, and Android and smartphones in general uh, – is kind of interesting in that uh, most of the time the reason that we get in our phones is because we've got a GPS chip that supports it, which at first blush is kind of weird. Why would your GPS chip give you FM radio support? Uh, it turns out in, in Europe and uh, other parts across Asia, one of the benefits that you can get by driving down the road, their emergency services have FM transmitters, low power, and highly directional in their cars. So if you've got somebody pulled over on the side of the road for an accident or for a traffic stop or if the bridge is out or if there's a detour ahead or if there's construction, the you can transmit down the road that Sorry. you've got this emergency coming up and give people who are around a corner, potentially driving Autobahn speeds, uh, some time to prepare for that, and it reduces the likelihood that you're going to have uh, further wrecks yeah, or, or problems. Neat. It's like a non-smartphone it, it, it cool. of crowdsource traffic apps. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, before we had Waze and whatnot, that's yeah. what we did. Um, so when you're integrating GPS into a handset, it makes sense to have uh, a reception of this type of, uh, of data coming to you so 
driving down the road, you can see, oh, just up ahead, there's this problem, and they could put GPS information into the radio signal oh. so you can see exactly where it was. In the U.S., we don't have that. We should, in my opinion, but uh, that that's kind of why we're getting some of the FM uh, capabilities in our phones is because people are buying chips in mass for GPS, and, well, why not just have a, a tuner app built right, in that you can then uh, listen to the radio with. Phone support GLONASS, even though we're not in Russia, because why yeah. not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Indeed. Joe, anyway, what have you so got there's, antenna wise yeah. there? Uh, there's my uh, antenna, if you can see that. So I'm going uh, to the camera on Joe the describe to our listeners what he's holding up. He appears to be holding up a portion of a trombone. <laughs> With, yes, uh, a large, large like garden hose attachment on it, and it's uh, now he's the moving it. Tuned to, to. You can see the end. Yeah, that that is a two meter ham radio antenna that I built okay. myself out of copper, and then just this uh, connection right here. I need to finalize my connections in the middle. It's but awesome. I bought my parts at Radio Shack. That's the tie-in. And we're so used to seeing antennas as you know um, components on a chip that you have to zoom into to look at. Yeah. And Joe and is meanwhile holding this like thing that you could, <laughs> if you like modified it only slightly, you could use it to attach the plumbing to your upstairs shower. It actually is uh, copper plumbing pipe. So that's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, antennas are the best. Radio frequency stuff. Um, there's something. Yeah. There's a pet project I've wanted to do for a long time. We're trying to work it out right now, where I can sort of take you on the journey of connecting a smartphone call or, or, or a smartphone data session and, and one of the steps, the crucial steps, like the the thing that I will require uh, if we end up doing it is that I, I need to climb a cell phone tower. I've wanted to do this for about for about <laughs> 10 years. I'll sign so, whatever waivers you need. The Just life and death of my location. Of a cell like site. Yeah. Testicular cancer? Like, what? that's, that's going to be on the waiver? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's you know, I'll I'll, I'll sign a, a waiver about that. I mean, it'd be worth it. If you would just send me. This. Look, I've got five kids. You know, I'm not <laughs> using it much anymore. All right, we'll talk about it, hmm. gentlemen. I think uh, I think it's time uh, to answer one or two more Q and A's, and then we'll jump into the the old listener mail here. Um, from uh, Pablo Maldonado. This was an early question that's been updated, upvoted quite a lot. Do you guys think that smart watches will matter to the general consumer? This is a well-timed question for a couple reasons, but not least of which because I saw Rich Brown from Phone Scoop uh, talking on Twitter to Avi, Avi Greengart, whose first name I can never remember how to pronounce, and uh, they're having basically this discussion, and I think Rich, Rich's position was that these are going to be maybe the next Bluetooth headset. You know, it's like there's an explosion of them, we see everybody with them, and then they then they go away. Hmm. What do you think, Taylor? I think that these are, I think, more useful than a Bluetooth headset. I mean, a Bluetooth headset is, is cool in that you can take calls, but you also look really ridiculous using it in public, and I always hated the fact that you would pass people using them in stores and they're seemingly talking to themselves in the corner. If right. somebody has their hand up to their wrist and they're talking to their watch or they're looking at it or whatever, you know that they're interacting with something. When something, it, it's, it's not as awkward in public. But we put and, up with people walking around, like, staring at their phones constantly. How is this much different? Right. That's that's my point. Like, a Bluetooth headset, you just kind of had people walking around, talking to themselves, looking like they were just clinically insane. <laughs> um, you don't get that same effect from a smartwatch. And I think mm. a smartwatch has more potential than a Bluetooth headset in that, one, you can get searches for simple things on it. You can get notifications. You can communicate with people from it more so than just speaking back and forth. A Bluetooth headset was cool, it was innovative, but at the same time it wasn't... It was like the Google Glass. I would I would say <laughs> Google Glass is more in line with a, a new age Bluetooth headset than a, a smartwatch. Hmm. What do you think, Joe? You're, you've recently unpackaged your LG G watch and shown us a couple fun things you can do with it. What's your, your view on this whole matter? Yeah, so uh, Android Wear... The smartwatches in general are Google Glass killers, in my opinion, which is kind of ironic. Uh, I have been using smartwatches way back since it was just a Bluetooth-connected watch that showed you who was calling and let you control your music. And that's really all it needs to do, just give you notifications and let you have basic controls. And for that purpose, it's the natural extension of a timepiece that you wear on your wrist 
and I just hope that somebody takes the uh, the Moto 360 and makes it into a pocket watch, because I would totally <laughs> wear one of those. That is going to be one of the first mods to it. I absolutely. Actually, Taylor, if you were still act aggressively running mod, I was going to pitch that to you. I'm like, I'll buy this thing if we can figure out a way to solder a uh, a pocket watch chain mount onto yeah, 3D it. 3D print a new uh, case for it or something. Oh, 3D print a case. Oh, oh that's wow. the way to do it. Yeah. 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 We're dumb for not thinking of that first. Good job, Since Stuart. That be. We did, and it's patented. You can't dig it. It's yeah. ours. Live yeah, on the air. on the podcast right now. Where did you, you cut that part out? Um, no, if anybody does that, I, I will review it aggressively. Um, I think I would buy it aggressively. <laughs> what uh, Joe was what? saying just a minute ago about how we've had Bluetooth or had Bluetooth connected smartwatches for a while with basic controls. I think he's right that these are the sort of features people are looking for, and despite how much I might like a smartwatch that does everything a smartphone does, it's just there's a demand isn't out there. At the same time, though, like Joe said, that these watches have been around for a long time, and yet they have not become that popular. I don't know if they've been ugly. Them. They're still not the prettiest things in the world. I mean, yeah, the Moto 360 is interesting because it's round. It's still thick as balls. I know, but the, the gear, it, the Gear Live is not is not a bad looking device. I mean, I I think it's actually quite good looking, and it it, it hasn't been long since fine. the Pebble Steel debuted. I mean, that's still relatively new, so we haven't seen good looking ones out for very long. So it's still nascent in that regard. I'm just not sure the aesthetics were what were keeping people away, and that while these features are attractive to some users, they're just not going to convince people to drive a couple hundred bucks on an accessory. It's, uh, I think it's, it's a... more than an accessory. It's a, it's a peripheral. You know, mm. yeah, it, it's more than just you know something that connects and receives calls or receives notifications. It is a peripheral in that you can interact with it and you can do different things with it that you couldn't do without it. You know, for instance. Um, that's probably a What can you do on the smartwatch you can't do with a smartphone? Oh, that's why I was backtracking. That was yeah. No, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Not, yeah. Absolutely nothing. That that is the thing. And th this is the this is the thing that people get they get hung up on when they're uh, in in commenting mode and they can't really see past it. It's not it's not a functionality thing. And Stephen, I know you know this. I'm not talking at you. I'm talking to, to to the people who stop there with their thought process because it's not a question of adding functionality. It's a question of adapting the form factor to something more convenient in some circumstances. Is it an edge case? Yes, but it's a valid one. It's not one that deserves uh, condemnation because just simply because it doesn't add more utility. Sure. You know? Sure. I mean, like, in, in a lot of ways, the smartphone I have now is not uh, fundamentally superior utility-wise to a, a BlackBerry that I carried in 2009. They can both do the same things in terms of utility. It's just that one of them does it better and more conveniently in most situations. And the situation breadth doesn't support that analogy, but in some cases, I am really, really happy to have a smartwatch because I don't need to go get my phone. Actually, I don't know where my Moto X is right now. But Jules Wong sent me a picture before, and uh, I can't see it. <laughs> but that's because of Google Voice. But if he had sent me a photo directly, I could see it on my watch if I was a normal person, and I could deal with it right now. But I've been getting message traffic on this watch throughout the entire podcast, and I can read it, even though I don't know where my phone is. And that's great, because the Are phone is not drunk? buzzing and interrupting the show. What? Are you drunk? You know where my phone is. <laughs> one no. word. You've heard me. I, I was drunk on the on Untethered. I'm not. I'm sober <laughs> now. This is very different. Oh. Also, during the entirety of Untethered, my posture was was thus. Like, right, <laughs> you know, I don't want to talk about that. I could you do that right now. I would. Deflated I Michael. Analog phone network. Um, I was I was actually for the last like five minutes trying to look up some traffic report for my girlfriend who was on a trek here. She's on oh. a long drive. So you guys were talking about using radios to look up traffic and stuff, and uh, I was actually having to do that through Waze, which was not helping me at all. Nice. <laughs> By the way, I, I want, there's, another, um, there's another way to do Q&A here, and I'm kind of trying it different, different ways because they, we get so much, guys, and I, thank you, listeners, for all of your live Q&A. There's just such an amazing volume that there's no way we can get through even a tenth of it. So we're going for the ones that are upvoted the most. So if you're looking for to get your Q&A answered on the air, make sure it's... Um, Sadly, it has to be something of broad appeal, which sucks, because there are ones with, like, way down at the bottom, and I'm like, oh, I want to talk about that. But anyway, I'll be arriving in the USA, says uh, Dushant Shri. Oh, oh, our friend Shri is coming to the U.S. for my master's oh. degree in August, and I'll be looking to get a new smartphone. 
Should I get a new device in August or wait until Q4 in the holiday season for new device releases and sales? Mm. Guys, wait. I always say wait. If Nexus 6 in August. August. Never buy a smartphone. Just, <laughs> just always oh, wait. This is why Taylor has been carrying a Moto Razor since 2005. Go to, uh, to swap us. <laughs> the best thing to do is to wait until this fall release schedule ends and then make your choice. Because there's always there's always going to be an iPhone in the fall. Maybe not mm-hmm. always, but in the last couple of years there have been iPhones in the fall, um, Galaxy Notes. What am I missing? Nexus. The new X Plus One, probably. Yeah, the new Maybe Motorola phone. The new yep. X Plus One. Um, we're looking at... There's at least one or two more in there. Hmm. I know it. But a lot of yeah, those that's, are coming that's out. The, the Nokia window where the where the high end Lumia. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Fall. So there's there's a a 1020 successor maybe is I mean, has there been any word about that? I haven't followed it. No, just the rumor about the end of lifeing the 1020. How, phone however, a because uh, it's uh, a year old now. As yeah. Miriam might say, uh, my my little uh, pinky tells me that uh, there there will be a the 1020 is not the last full pure view phone we will see. So, I would wait until September at least. I think if you keep pushing to the holiday season, there's going to be a few models that will come out, the good ones. But I think that after IFA and in the weeks following that, by the end of summer at least, we're going to get a lot of the major announcements. So if you can, you know, go without a new phone for a month, you're going to have some solid options. At least know what you'll be looking for and more about what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, welcome uh, prematurely. Welcome to the to the states, Shri. It'll be good to have you here. Um, one, uh, two more questions. One very quickly. Hey guys, I have a Pebble. Says Matthew Miller. I'm going to buy Apple's wearable later this year, though. Would it be a good idea for me to buy an Android Wear device and pair it with my HTC One and then return it in a few weeks to get a feel for new smartwatches? No. Don't do that. No. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. I mean, yeah, there is I... a. There, Buy it and sell it on Swappa. On Swappa. <laughs> yeah. Ta-da. Don't don't do that if you do the Gear Fit. I'll tell you that it's, it ain't moving. Uh, someone buy my Gear mm-hmm. Fit. Uh, no, <laughs> the thing is, it's not that I have an objection to the buy it and then return it um, approach. I, I've done it before. It's not it's not really nice, but it, you know, if you need to do it, you should do it. But it's it's just that you shouldn't get an Android Wear device to see what a modern smartwatch feels like because it doesn't. It's not a good experience on the whole. I don't think. Joe, do you agree or disagree? Well, uh, I'm actually... Well, let me show you. You see that? Unfortunately, Unfortunately Android Wear has Android stopped. Wear has stopped. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. That doesn't happen I, to me yet. I, I got something, and it just won't work at all from my Nexus to my Wear. But my Nexus 7, it works fine. So it's not the watch. It's something on my phone. I don't well, know You've what. also, like, rooted your G-Watch, and you, like, root your phone. You, you do crazy shit with your phone all the time, don't you? I, I'm, I'm rooted there. And, by the way, Preview 10 of the Goma custom ROM came out, so I, I ran that today uh, yeah. to try and fix it, and it didn't. Uh, that could I'm be sorry. it, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'm running stock, and it, you know, Android Wear at least does half of what it's advertised to do. It's not. It I'm, it's works not for my Nexus Seven, though. So I don't know. Flawed. Yeah, no. I mean, the thing is, it's just. Uh, it, it, it's Matthew, it, it's, it's a 1.0 product. Yeah, it's it's actually, in my opinion, it's a beta product masquerading as a 1.0 product. Yeah, it, I don't think it should have been released this early, and um, I wouldn't get it now. No, 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 no. Uh, preview on that. Our Android Wear review is going to go up um, tomorrow morning, I think. So We already have the video reviews up with the G-Watch and the, and the Gear Live. If you guys missed them, go check them out. The 60-second reviews as well. But the written review for Android Wear is going up tomorrow morning. So, um, Yeah. It's, you know, I wish the Moto 360 was out because I would be a lot more forgiving if I was carrying that that piece of hardware, I think. But Possibly. Anyway. I wrote yeah. in my piece yesterday about Pebble or the day before. I don't remember. All my days run together. But I wrote that I'm probably not going to get rid of my steel now. It's just... I'm just happy with it. I understand. It's a good-looking watch. Yeah, and and it does the job it says it's going to do. And, like, I don't know. Wear is great for a lot of things, and I I don't hate it, but it really wasn't ready for for release, in my opinion. Um, Uh, The the message, the random email from Eric might have changed that. My, my, (laughs) My opinion on Pebble... You're such a you're so easily swayed by star power. You're the enemy of journalism. <laughs> hey guys, let's move into listener mail. Sound the bong bong. Done. 
Let's uh, see what's up here. Who wants to start? Because uh, no, I tell you what. I'll start out listener mail. Someone be ready to pick up the next person on the list uh, because I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Joseph Scheidler, who sent along a wonderful comic that I'm sure some of you have seen. It's in the post at Pocket Now right now. Um, go visit the podcast post to see this uh, wonderful comic from BizarroComics.com, uh, which depicts Kirk and Spock having traveled back in time to 2014 and they're in their uniforms holding their communicators out on the sidewalk and uh, they're approached by two contemporary men saying, where'd you get those old phones? Did they do anything other than make calls? <laughs> Sadly, Joseph, no. Yes, I had seen this before. <laughs> no, but they do contact an orbiting starship. Without the use of a cell tower, so they're still, you know, awesome. It's a but side analog. effect of sci-fi. We're always going to write about it with our perceptions of the current day. You know, you look back at these movies trying to show futuristic sets. They have neon lights, buttons everywhere, and yet there's these giant CRT displays <laughs> that are just... You don't even see them yep. even now. We're decades away from where they were trying to show a future escape. So you, what are you going to do? You, you work with what you know. That's exactly right, and we've we've talked about this quite a bit. I actually talked about this a lot on last night's episode of Trek FM, which I, uh, which we 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 covered future technology a little bit. And actually, I didn't know that Mac OS Ken um, is a is a Star Trek guy, and so I met him last night. You know, strangely, there's no crossover besides him and me, I guess. Nobody else, and Joe. Nobody else cares about Star Trek in the tech world, which is just. Did you guys notice the uh, the vehicles in the background of this comic? There's Bunny's, a uh, Bunny's Pie Repair with a slice of pie on the roof, and then down the street is Kaboom Laxatives. <laughs> so. I did not see that. That's good attention to detail. It's a wonderful <laughs> comic. Really. It is. It is. Uh, thank you for that, Joseph. Uh, why doesn't... Um, it, I accidentally deleted this email, so I'd love it if somebody else could read the email from yeah, uh, Nachiketa Ramesh. Which one was I that? I got this one. one. Okay. All right. Nachiketa. Keta writes, Dear Pocket Now, my question's about MHL. How exactly does it work? I understand that in some cases it streams video from the screen out directly, as for games. However, while playing video, it streams just the video without the controls and borders and other bits of the app UI that show up when it's on your phone screen. Does this mean that the video alone is being streamed in full resolution? Does this mean that a phone with 720p display can stream a 1080p video over MHL directly to the television? I also want to know what happens in the case of QHD phones, like the new G3. Does video get downsampled to 1080p, or does it mean that a QHD phone can only stream if you have a QHD TV to receive that signal? Coming also, up, I think, is the most redundant, uh, <laughs> the most redundant part of the email, as I recall. But go ahead. <laughs> does the G3 come with MHL 3.0? It's the latest standard for QHD. And can the Xperia Z2 stream QHD video or 4K in full quality, as that's also one of those MHL 3.0 capable phones? And wisely notes, I think this question would be best suited for Joe Levi. We do too. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we've been sitting on this for, like, weeks. I'm like, i got to get you on the podcast. I don't even know what half of this shit means. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, MHL is really cool. Um, you could consider it uh, to be a subset or uh, a contemporary of HDMI. Uh, it, there's some crossover, and it, it's not exactly that. Think of it as MHL is HDMI over a micro USB connector, and that's pretty much it. Uh MHL gives you the ability to get power down from the, uh, the the TV or whatever device you're going into, so you can charge your device while you're watching whatever you want to watch on it. Um, that is very handy. MH I didn't know. HDMI didn't didn't support that. That's pretty cool. No, no, no. I, I, HDMI doesn't until you get up into the upper levels, but the MHL spec requires it. So nah. there you go. Uh, MHL one was 720p. Uh, and MHL2 got you up into 1080p. MHL3, I didn't look up to see if that supports QHD. But yeah, I would assume. Uh, so getting into the questions here. Uh, when you stream something like Netflix or video up onto your screen using uh, MHL as your conduit, you're sending the video stream. Now that video stream, as you wisely mentioned down here later, when you're streaming a game up, it doesn't include any of the Chrome that's around it, any of the controls, any of the borders or whatnot. Uh, that comes down to two different components. One is what is the chip, your graphics chip, your GPU itself, sending out to that separate screen, your second screen, 
Uh, is it doing true mirroring or is it a second screen? And then what is the uh, what is the app sending over? Some apps are smart enough to say, I don't want to show any of the controls or stuff on a big screen, so I'm just going to have those as an overlay on the local screen and just send the video source out to the TV. So this so, is intentional, not a side effect of MHL. It, it could be a side effect, uh, an unintentional effect, but usually it's a feature where you know, you're, you're playing a game, you don't want to see the controls on the screen if you're watching it. You want to see those on your pad that yeah, you're just playing in your game. Right. right, you want to see what the game wants you to see, and, like, you, you don't need the controls on a different display. Yeah. So, yeah, it can see it. that's a built-in. Exactly. Yeah. And that can happen at either the app level or the, the GPU level. You can have that done. Uh, remember, in some of our newer SOCs, that you can have uh, up to four uh, full HD streams coming out supported by those chips. So what if I want? What if I have a, te- a touchscreen television? Yeah, come on. Touchscreen television, and I want to play guys. the game on the TV. You, you should probably Android re- TV. Re- yeah, request a remote uh, control for a touchscreen television would basically just be like a bouncy ball, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Squash racket. Yeah. 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 Write write an email to the app developer and say you want that feature to to have a toggle. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, regarding the the devices, uh, the next question that you had was. Uh, does downsampling happen? Again, that's going to be a feature of not only the screen that you're going out to, but also the chip that you're running through. So if you have a 1080p display on your smartphone, but your TV is only 720, there's going to be some downsampling that happens, and that could happen on your device, it could happen in the TV, it could happen in both. Uh, So things can get a little bit wonky, and you can lose some resolution because of it. The same thing is going to apply when you've got a 4K screen going to a 1080p TV. Yes, it's going to be intelligent downsampling, but that means that things can be weird and happen strangely. Uh, regarding the devices that you mentioned, I have no idea who has what anymore. Look on the spec sheet. Let's see, it says here the Z2 and the Z2 tablet support 4K output, which is good because they can, I think, record 4K video, so you have to have yeah. some way to watch it. Absolutely, you want to offload that. Yeah, certainly. Um, is that? Are we coming toward toward the end of uh, of that one there? That that's the end of that question. Uh, so Sweet. thank you for uh, holding that one for me. Very very interesting that's topic good. to research. Wasn't there like a, wasn't there like a crucial detail on that one? We missed. Christ, Michael. <laughs> P.S. Michael, you look hot with glasses. Listen, I needed to. I needed that read aloud to counteract last week's insult of my other glasses. So there, I wouldn't have. It's not vanity, it's balance. Okay. If you want your okay. email read on the air, make sure you say somewhere that Michael looks sexy, I guess. That's Definitely the, need, <laughs> yes, the compliments are required. Uh, who's next? Big Cy, Big C, rather, is, is next. And um, if someone can find his m- mail first, I was trying to find it a second ago. I'm still using yeah, I've kind of it. Of it. Kick. Go ahead, Joe. It says, uh, hello, Pocket Now Podcast. I wanted to bring up a topic of discussion that I have never heard anyone talk about on Pocket Now. At least I don't believe has been talked about. The cameras on smartphones. No, we talk about those all the time. But more specifically, the camera focal length, or wide angle as they call it. Some cameras on smartphones capture much more picture than others. I know the Motorola Razr was terrible at capturing a broader image, while the camera on my HTC M8 is amazing at capturing an entire picture. For example, I've included a picture for reference from my favorite, the Pocket Now Samsung Galaxy S5 versus HTC One M8 video. Both pictures taken from the same spot. Notice with the HTC, the added sky above the building, uh, the added text on the sign below, the entire building on the left, etc. Why don't cell phone manufacturers use this uh, to their advantage for advertising? And have you ever noticed this when using other smartphone camera? Thanks, Craig. Big C. P.S. I love the HTC One M8. I love the camera for this feature alone. Big C. Mm. I have a, a, a handy tip for you. I love it when you write in, by the way. Thank you for your mail. Read any of my other reviews. I this I am completely with you on this. Um, camera angle, the, the 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 width of the lens. I don't know the actual photographic term we're talking about, but the the area of capture is so important to me. I've been talking about this since I did my first review. I mean, it's, it's in all the written reviews if it's not mentioned in the video ones. There is nothing more frustrating than holding up a smartphone to try and take a picture of, say, your airplane lunch when you're on the plane, which I've done. And it's lame, but whatever, I do it. And it's like, I'm holding my phone here, the tray is down here, 
and yet the for some reason my field of view is confined to like a quarter of my my meal. Right. And, but but uh, some yeah. phones allow for a total wide wide view capture. I mean, I hate having to back up like this when I'm trying to take a picture. What are you saying, Steve? I feel like we're talking about two different things. Focal length is, I think, separate than field of view, which it we're is. also talking about here. Okay. Because being able to do you know macro shots is one thing versus being able to you know get the building and its surroundings or just the building. So these are, are two different. I'm talking about focal length. It makes no, it no, because I'm not talking about focal length. I'm not talking about like getting so close that I can't. Right, right, right. I'm talking about like expecting to have the whole thing in the frame and then being like, why am I so? Why is this so close? And I'm like, am I am I zoomed in? Am I cropping? No, I'm not. It's just a narrow view. I hate that. So yeah, no, that's I I prefer the. It's one of the reasons. Right, and we talk about how on some of the the front facers now are getting better with these wider field of views, so you can get more people in the shot at once. In front facing, it's it's hugely important. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But um, but yeah, it, it's on the primary shooters that nobody seems to talk about. And I agree with you, Big C. I don't think a lot of people talk about, but no, we I talk about it all the time because it's now. Is that big... something that is just the camera, or is that something that you can do with lenses that go over the camera? Uh, I'm thinking of like the fisheye lens that helps really open up that uh, that angle of view. Uh, sometimes with comical effects. I feel like yeah. lenses are a non-starter for a lot of smartphone users, but yeah, you can always could conceivably bring a wider field of view in with a little add-on, if there's even one available. Well, yeah. for Steven, I'm you not even talking check about this. big lenses. Oh, I'm yeah, talking yeah. just, you know, a, a little lens overlay on top of the uh, the camera sensor itself might be able to do worlds of good. And then, of course, we've got the, uh, the liquid lenses that uh, some... Do we have those, or do we just talk about them? About oh, the, the lenses that can reconfigure themselves yeah. based on electric current running through yeah, the, a liquid uh, lens? Oh, it's the, so cool. the adaptable more uh, transformers. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. There, there you it's, go. It's nanobots. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, yeah. Just to, to, we have to move on. But Big C, uh, yeah, it's it, it's something that I'm I'm very concerned with. Yeah, we we do we do cover that aspect. So read the written reviews. If you only look at the videos, um, I know the written reviews can go long. I, I talk too much, but it, it's in there uh, most of the time. So let's move on to uh, t Taylor. Would you like uh, Would you like to read one of these? Would you like to read the one from Paul Woolacott? Or if if you don't have it available, I've got it. You can read the next. One. Available, I do. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm any better at reading than I once was, but oh come on, we just funny. haven't heard from you in a while. I miss you. Taylor, oh, words yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being my go-to source for all things mobile tech related. With the announcement that uh, with Android L we will finally be getting USB audio, a la iOS. Why do you think it will be? Or it has taken Google so long to implement this feature, and will it work the same as Apple's in implementation? I'm not really familiar with USB audio other than uh, the fact that I know that I could plug in my mic to, uh, and this could be the other thing. I, I haven't looked into USB audio. I know I can plug in a, this mic, not this mic, maybe my other mics to my iPad and, and record audio. I've been doing that for the untethered intros and for different things for several months now. But yeah, is, um... is that what it's covering, or is it... Audio yeah, what it's, out. it's talking about audio out. Instead of plugging uh, an analog headphone into the headphone jack, you would plug in a USB cable. So you get a digital signal from your phone, and then a digital to analog conversion would occur in the headphone itself. And the idea there is you can have higher end, lower noise circuitry than you get on it. I mean, the phone is going to be the, the cheapest component that does its job well enough for most people. So this is going to appeal to premium users. And Apple's doing, we're seeing, uh, we're talking about lightning accessories that have a digital audio signal coming out to the headphones. Well, and this is a perfect tie-in with the email that we just read about MHL, because one of the channels in MHL is that audio, and out of that, you can get full 7.1 surround sound. So if you're utilizing MHL as your audio source, you've already got it built in, and then really all you're doing is plugging in a, a little set of speakers that you call headset, or maybe you're plugging it into your surround sound and getting full, big, glorious sound out of it. Um, I think ultimately the good thing is going to be getting rid of the headphone jack because we need as few no. holes in our devices as possible. But what about jack. pressing? Oh, hey, hey, what about get pressing? Get rid of it. Gone. Wow. Wow. Dear <laughs> a, a USB. How will we ever press Taylor's pressy. buttons? Come on. USB pressy. Um, that one right I'm going to use your square credit cards, you know? USB? Mm. See, the problem is I use my USB port way more than I use my headphone jack. 
Well, so, that sounds like a lifestyle choice that you should. How are you going to listen to your headphones when you're charging your phone? We can get the wireless charger, but oh, we'll, we'll go back to the old HD, the old HTC adapters. Yeah. I was just going to mention oh. that because oh. they they actually did that. You had uh, micro or mini, sorry, mini USB on one side and audio on the other side, and if you wanted to charge at the same time, they had a a little Y adapter that you plugged in, and oh. there what about you go. The palms where you couldn't even do that. Yeah, the the Veer. Yeah. yeah, it was it was actually last week the history thing that I wrote last week, four or five years ago was when HTC announced that it would finally be starting use starting to use um, three point five millimeter headphone jacks. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have. I want a clarification while we're talking about the USB port. Uh, Peter Friedrich uh, tells us the G three has no MHL support. It has Slim port. Yes. I wanted to know, Joe, if you could tell us in the in the in one sentence what the difference is. Um, they are not compatible with each other, so you have uh, to buy different accessories. That sucks. Yeah, and um, one other Q&A to, to handle here uh, from, um, uh, just, just if you know, there it is, from Samuel Islam. Why? With three exclamation points. We, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Be- because uh, we can. <laughs> there, Why not? There is a very good and very simple answer to that question. Because. 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 Because is right. Matthew Nichols writes in, says, "Longtime listener, love the show, guys. Thanks for listening, Matthew. Um, Michael, I purchased a Samsung Galaxy Gear this December. It had about 20 apps in the store. Not too shabby, but a year and a half later, or a half a year later, the store has around 25. The store has not received much developer support. The functionality is limited. Do you think this will be the case with Android Wear? Or since it's Google, do you think it'll take care of it better? It would be an honor to be featured in the Pocket Now Weekly. Thanks, Matthew from Lubbock, Texas. Matthew." Consider yourself honored. Now the honor is ours for reading your uh, your well phrased and, and brief email. Yeah, I think Android Wear is going to do much better with this. It already uh, has. Yeah, we've got a hundred and some odd today. Oh, is that how many apps dropped today for Android Wear? What did I I was just reading? I think we're up to a hundred and fifty. It's just been it amazing. I mean, we, we had a, it's yeah. eclipsed the Glass apps already, and it's yeah, been out a far shorter of time. Yeah. Right. And I, this should be no no surprise to anyone. You know, Samsung is is uh, is pretty good at, at stocking some compelling apps. I mean, I know it, it's 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 fashionable as always to hate on the gear, but there are some great apps on the gear, and then some of the gear products run really well. And I'm talking about the Tizen gears, not the Gear Live. Another effing confusing Interesting thing. Interesting, you mentioned yeah. Tizen there, but keep going. Okay, um, but yeah, yeah, no, this is already better. I've noticed an, an explosion in wallpapers even in just a day. I mean, I bought the, the G-Watch and the Gear Life came in, and like the next day, people were like, have you seen the Star Trek wallpaper yet? I'm like, no, not, but now I have. Thank you very much, Internet. So you're calling that wallpaper, but those are watch faces. Watch faces, yeah, not watch, yeah, 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 yeah. So between the watch faces and the apps, it's, I mean, and the the quality of the apps is great on Android Wear. I mean, it's the uh, Duolingo uh, app, which I think I made fun of on this show a couple weeks ago when you guys recommended it to me. I should not have because I've been using it a whole lot and it's really awesome. So, I mean, thanks for the reco. But th- I, th- this is Android Wear is destined to do much better as in terms of ecosystem than. The uh, than the Samsung's own special line, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. the APIs and the, and the SDK and the developer support for it, um, and just the fact that you're not writing an app for the watch, you're writing an app for Android, which has a component for the watch. Uh, mm. That that part right there is the, that's the winning solution. It, it's not something completely separate. Um, it definitely sets up Android Wear as a companion device, and the apps follow that same metaphor. They're a companion to what runs on the phone, even if the thing on the phone is just a placeholder to to push the code over. A minute ago, Michael was talking about uh, Tizen, and I think it's interesting how Samsung's having this problem with the gear. It doesn't have a lot of apps available. The number isn't growing. We're seeing pretty much exactly the same thing over with its effort to get Tizen into phones because it's announced the Samsung Z already, and it's kind of holding off on making it available because it said outright we need there to be more apps. They're just not there. And I'm wondering, you know, if it can't get anyone to create apps for the gear, which is already available, has people buying it, what chance does Tizen have with no real hardware out in the market yet? No one's going to take the time to develop for it. So it's... Samsung's going to buckle and rely <laughs> on Android again for its app support. That's, that's gotta probably get. what's going to happen. As usual, well, a very difficult time to understand or, or predict what Samsung is. is I, I got to opine on that a little bit. We saw Samsung, uh, pun intended, gearing up for 
replacing Android and Google services with their own their own market, their own everything. Um, they had books, they had uh, movies, they had TV, they had all kinds of other stuff, and now they're kind of pulling back away from that. They're getting rid of supporting that. So I think the whole Samsung without Google, uh, the whole ecosystem is just starting to collapse, and I think this is just another uh, more evidence to that. They need, they to need collapse, Android. You have to, you have to, they need you know. Google. <laughs> yeah, they need Google. You have, to, you have to have built something first. And there was a moment, I think, when the Galaxy S4 came out and we were seeing some of the back-end stuff get rewritten in Samsung and, like, their, their their content store and stuff like that. And it was actually really beautifully laid out. And this is what I'm talking about. Samsung can, like, um, initially imp- impress with, with design and stuff. It's like, oh, this is very clean and this is actually quite easy to use. But then, uh, as pointed out in the email, it's like it, it gets to a point where they've, they woo in a certain number of developers, and it's like, okay, this could be cool. Let's see how it grows. And then it doesn't grow at all. You don't get the yeah. critical mass. Is what I was just going to say those words exactly. They're, they're not reaching that point of critical mass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move to the last email. Would, uh, who, hasn't, uh, who would like to read the last email of the show? Volunteers from the audience. Joe, what, you've got sure. it pulled up? Great. Uh, I mean, it, it's it, either of you. We can fight for We haven't heard anything. Joe's... Russell? Tones a lot on the show. Joe, I had to succumb to uh, imitating <laughs> last time when you uh, submitted your response in writing. I, 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 I heard that. I, uh, I think you did. Did you like it? I did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. So VJ says, hi, guys. I live in Chicago, and I take public transit to work. I think I saw Adam Dowd on the blue line one day. Hey. Theft is a major concern for me, so I have a pin unlocked for my phone, and then... Uh, and Android Device Manager, just in case it gets lost. Good job. Do that. Set it up. Uh, I've tried Face Unlock, but it's just not accurate enough. Uh, accurate enough of the time. What methods do you use to keep your device secure from prying eyes? Thanks ooh, as ooh, always, ooh. VJ. I've got one. Yeah. What is it, Taylor? Time Pin. It is brilliant. It's from Justin Case, who does a lot of Android development work, so hacks and roots and all kinds of stuff. He's the developer who got S off or helped get S off on the HTC One M8. Um, he created Time Pin, which is, it, it replaces the default pin lock on your phone. So you have to set a default pin lock, which is your fallback if you forget, you know, whatever it may be for the other. And every time you reboot, you have to push in or punch in your um, your default pin. But once you enable Time Pin, it changes your pin every minute. So it's like one of those RSA uh, security tags. Yeah, so it it'll be either the four-digit time, or you can do modifications on that. You could do reverse the time, or double the time, or mirror the time, so you do four digits forward, four digits backwards, all kinds of stuff. So you can really set it up and do whatever you want with it, but it's different every single time. So if someone watches you put in your pin, it doesn't matter. They don't know it a few minutes later. Unless they know that you're using time pin and what modifications you're using. Yeah, all this talk about device security is well and good, but I feel like I don't, I don't put any security on my phone at all. I don't have a lock screen. I don't got nothing. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you lose the device itself, that's the, the big loss there. You know, you can deactivate your accounts remotely. But if you're out of the hardware, you lost you know, several hundred bucks there. I think physical security is where I put my focus. You know, keep he it... He carries his person. smartphone in an don't armored it box that is, that is <laughs> well, riveted to his you, thigh. You know? You need an LD West holster so that people <laughs> yes. who want to steal your stuff will reach into your armpit and they don't want to do that. I, I carry mine in that Pelican case from Nokia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get that uh, people are, are concerned because their device is tied to all these services out there. But if look at it as an analogy. Everyone carries a credit card on them. And if someone steals your credit card, you know, until you get around to canceling it, they can go and ring up as many purchases as they want. Yet we still haven't, you know, fallen back to a cash-only uh, society because we're, you know, worried about that they're going to do that because of the convenience. So Very I don't true. think that just having this connection to uh, the ability for someone to take something from you and keep on causing you harm is necessarily going to, uh, you know, cause us to take extra precautions. It just doesn't well, fit. We also don't have as advanced credit card systems here in America as they do in other countries. Chip and pin is um, coming. It yeah. is coming. But, uh, coming. Uh, Stephen, I'm with you, but I, you know, I do not have any security on my phone either, and it's because of a convenience thing. It's, um, and right. I, by, by that I mean login security. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with a, a code 
to unlock my phone. I don't want to do face unlock because. But then it's... what about like fingerprint unlock? Assuming it worked well, I'm assuming uh, if it worked well, I would yeah, be all about, about it. If it well, but okay. you can, but it does it doesn't. And I use my phone one handed quite a lot. I'm usually doing something else out in the world. And when you're asking me to balance a phone in my hand and swipe my thumb on the bottom most portion of the face mm-hmm. so that it's begging for it to fall on the side. No, I'm not going to do that. F you. But sorry. But what? um. Recently, actually yesterday, I switched back to the Moto X. So I'm not using the M8 right now. I'm using the Moto X. And what I'm doing with that is time pin and trusted devices. So when it's connected to my Pebble, it's never locked. But if Ah, I walk away from my phone, it locks. Now, that's built into Android L. I don't know if it's active yet. But I know something very similar to trusted devices is in Android L. So would you then, wearing a smartwatch and having the ability to do that, Use a, a pin lock, Michael, yeah. and Stephen. Because then it, yeah. it doesn't pop if up. If I didn't if have to home, put in the pin all the time, yes, I, I would. Yes, absolutely. I on, think that's very smart. If you're on your home Wi-Fi network or in a geolocate, like a geofenced area, yeah. or connected to whatever Bluetooth device you want, it's yeah. disabled. Yeah, but so, I don't leave Bluetooth on regularly. I'm a real battery miser. I turn all my videos really, on. Oh, you got to get one of these. Bluetooth 4. It's hey, Stephen, are, are you going to... Hold on, Joe, you're going to have the last word on this because this is a security issue, but I want to ask Stephen... Well, <laughs> I want to ask Stephen, um, do you, are you going to use that Martian notifier that we, that we picked up? This puppy here? Yeah, I've mm-hmm. been playing around with it uh, for a little last night. I'm not sure how I feel about it just yet. I need some more experimentation. All right, we're going to talk about that next week, so be ready for it because uh, I, I want to trade opinions with you. Joe mm-hmm. Levi, your, your, your word on this, on securing your phone. We're all crazy. Yes, so I have used uh, Face Unlock on my devices almost exclusively, and the first iteration, it was painful. The second iteration where you can improve face matching made it almost 100%. Uh, nine times out of ten, it'll recognize my face and unlock, and it's fast. Uh, the other one out of ten times, there's either glare on the device, or I wasn't holding it very well, or it was dark. Uh, it so it's usually just one of those non-permissive ones. Them. Well, I unlock a lot, because I've got it set... Uh, once my screen is off for five minutes, it locks. If I turn my screen off using the power button, it locks after 30 seconds. So I am kind of mitigate when it locks with that, but I've got to lock it. Now, I've got five kids at home, and they love nothing more than picking up the phones and going and buying crap. And we had one kid who bought 300-some-odd dollars worth of stuff for his aquarium uh, one Sunday. And yeah, in-app purchases are evil. Uh, So now we all have some kind of security here at home. Uh, Pin... Pin is fine for us most of the time. Pattern, he can figure those things out. He's, He's... just turned seven, and holy crap, and he can figure those things out. At work, at my day job, I've got an exchange server, and they just upped the security level that we have to have on connected devices. We can no longer use any of these fancy things like face unlock, so I've got to go back to pin or password. And for that, uh, I I have a pin. It's a, uh, depending on which one I use, I switch them. They're four to eight characters long. Now, I really want to get a good sense for how people should be should be securing. So, can you tell us your pins verbatim, please, both of them? Yes, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five. Thank it's you. My luggage combination. I know. Yeah. It's what it's I use. Real, everybody. I gotta go. I gotta go buy some stuff from my aquarium. We'll see you later. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so I think securing your device, even if it's from small hands or somebody who's snooping around that shouldn't be, is a good thing. I think everybody should do that. It is not device security. Uh, encrypting your device is a very good thing for other reasons that kind of goes along with this, but not exactly. Uh, and then last but not least is if you do not have Android Device Manager or the iPhone equivalent set up, do it now. Uh, you will thank yourself when you lose it uh, because you'll. it's not easy to set it up when the device isn't in your hand. I'm going to do that tonight, Joe. Thank you for the, uh, for the suggestion. All right, and thanks. while I have, while you have the floor or while you have the last bit of the floor, VJV, thank you for the uh, excellent email to close us out and to answer the final Q&A. It's not a question at all, but it's a wonderful statement from Zach. Nice to see you on the weekly, Joe. Got a lot of upvotes, and I agree. Joe, it is nice to have you on the show. Let's do it more often. Yes, let's. Gentlemen, I think uh, we got to head on out of here. Anybody got a closing thought before we do? 
sleep. Well, you can't throw us at that. I mean, I we know, gotta right? have time to prepare. Gentlemen, got a vague, vague question for you. Anybody got a specific answer? No, no, no. All right. I said sleep. Oh, okay. Oh, How sleep. about this one? That's my weekend task. Eat, drink, and be merry for YOLO. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I can't see. Oh, see, I couldn't. I couldn't see. I had the script already of the. You know, there's. It's good. I think our dismount here, folks, is really great. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Stephen looks horrified that he even came on this show. I'm gonna pretend to be. I'm gonna get a box on Monday with Stephen's camera and his microphone. It's like thanks, but no thanks. I'm done. I gave no college try. I mean, <laughs> gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. It's been wonderful, Taylor. Your eyewear is on, and it looks like you're you're heading out. I am. No, I mean I just didn't know. Are those gunners? Yeah. Why weren't you wearing those the whole time? That's I put awesome. Them on earlier. I put them on earlier. My my. Eyelashes like rub the lenses. Oh, eyelashes are too long. Oh, so I do hate that. I too. use the headphones to like suspend them. They're they're actually suspended over my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, um, yeah, Gunner Optics, not our sponsor, but maybe should be. Um, folks, Probably should be. We'll talk to them. They talked to me on Google Plus. That, <laughs> no, that network that you refuse to. Except yeah, I'm not going to invest any time in hanging out there. But, I, I just you know, noticed okay. looking at all your guys' uh, little bars on here, the ridiculous URLs you expect people to enter in for Google Plus there. I with, don't like, the want to no, like, Tony made this for me, and I was really happy. And I was like, Tony, that <laughs> URL sucks. I have a custom one now, and then we just haven't had time to fix oh, yeah. it. Yeah, home Joe <laughs> has the old school one, with which has the big old Twitter handle, which I actually like better because it's actually visible. Like People are going to follow you for that, Joe. Follow Joe Levi. Actually, yeah. all right. I'm Should on Twitter. I, Talk yeah. to me. We're gonna. T I'm gonna tell everybody where to find you, folks. Our transition track is Radiation. It's a ringtone on the Nexus 4, Nexus S, and Galaxy Nexus. They're old phones, but if you want to listen to the full-length song, Ali Spagnola did it. She's an artist with millions of fans around the world. Live shows and concerts that put a new spin on the term Power Hour. I'm gonna have some beers. Drunk tonight, by the way. skis. Uh, yes, Allie and drunk skis. <laughs> Allie has a bunch of fun videos at her YouTube channel, and I'm not just saying that. You should go youtube.com slash Allie Spags and at AllieSpagnola.com. Both of them linked in the description below. And while you're checking that out, we will tell you that that is going to do it for this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly. Tune in next week for another episode and send us listener mail to podcast at pocketnow.com. We haven't missed listener mail once since we hit episode 100. That's pretty cool. Also, be sure to find us on Twitter. Joe tweets about YOLO, Android, and the technical errors in your favorite TV shows at Joe Levi. And Ham Radio. Taylor tweets about everything and anything and also gets into big internet fights at Casper Tech, <laughs> T-A-S-P-E-R-T-E-K. Stephen is picking up the pace, tweeting at least twice per month at Stephen I'm tweeting Tang. I'm damn good and ready. And I <laughs> talk about Star Trek and smartphones and the unmagnificent lives of adults at Captain Two Phones. It's Captain the Number Two Phones. You can also follow Pocket Now on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and Google+. And if you enjoy the podcast, and we hope you do, please, Leave us a review on iTunes, Xbox Music, Stitcher, wherever else podcasts are heard. We still need those reviews to get more people listening. As always, we thank you so much for listening, and we thank our sponsor at swapa.com. And we'll be back to talk next week. <laughs>